Good morning. My name is Lene Palmasano. I'm the chair of the budget committee, and I'm going to call this meeting to order. With me at the dais are council members Johnson, Goodman, Schrader, Cunningham, Fletcher, Jenkins, and Cano. We will be joined by others shortly. Uh, please let the record reflect that we have a quorum. Colleagues, today's meeting is the first of three hearings to invite the public to share with us their ideas, their concerns, even their suggestions about the mayor's 2020 recommended budget. As you know, we added a third hearing uh, time to our budget process last year, and we're repeating that again this year. I think that this additional opportunity for public participation and the increased transparency in our city's budget is a positive and an important step that we can take to be accountable to you, our constituents. We'll be conducting two additional public hearings at different times, as in prior years, and those have been noticed to the public, and they're included on the Council's published calendar for many months now. The next public hearing will be Wednesday, December 4th, beginning at 6.05 p.m. That is the truth in taxation hearing that is required by state law. Our goal is to hear from everyone. Different than in years past, we are all here. All 13 members are part of our budget committee, so we would ask that people who come today and speak today, if you feel the need to come to a future hearing, that you let everybody who hasn't had a chance to speak yet speak before you sign in. We feel that would be most fair. The third and final public hearing will be on Wednesday, December 11th at 6.05 p.m. Both of those public hearings will be conducted in this chamber, and they, but those are adjourned meetings of the full city council and not of this committee, although it has all the same people. We anticipate that the full council will take final action on our proposed 2020 budget following its public hearing on December 11th, so that same night. Before we get started, I want to review some basic information about the budget. Mayor Fry has proposed a $1.62 billion budget to, the fin to finance the city's operations next year, exclusive of the Independent Board in of Estimate and Taxation and the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. That includes an increase in the property tax levy of about 6.95%. A copy of the mayor's recommended budget is posted to the city website and a full printed copy is available for public inspection with the city clerk. This committee has conducted a series of hearings on each department's budget over the past several weeks. All of those meetings were broadcast on the city's TV channel and they are streamed on the city's website. All of the documentation from those meetings has been posted and made available to the public on our city's budget website. Before we open the floor to public comments, I'll, re I'll review a few procedural matters. First, we will be taking speakers in the order they are registered. If you wish to speak as part of this hearing and you haven't already registered, I invite you to do that now. You can register with the clerk, Mr. Carl, or outside. Um, or outside at the tables. Also, if you have any documentation that you'd like us to have, that you can submit that for the public record and you can just give those materials to the clerk after your speaking time. Each speaker will be given two minutes to address the committee. We ask everyone to be respectful of all speakers and of all the opinions offered. This hearing is a neutral forum where all residents are invited to comment on the proposed spending plan and the priorities included in the mayor's recommended budget. Out of respect for all speakers, we ask that if you are testifying today, you conclude your comments when your time has expired and allow the next speaker their opportunity to address the committee. We have a timer set up to help speakers monitor the use of their time so that they can wrap up their comments. Also, the clerk does have some blank comment sheets for those who would prefer to submit their testimony in writing, and that also will be included in the public record of this hearing. With that, we're ready to open the public hearing. And the first speaker is Mary Albrecht. Welcome, Mary. Hello, City Council members. My name is Mary Albright, Executive Director of Longfellow Seward Healthy Seniors. We're one of the Living at Home Block Nurse programs that currently receives sitting funding to help seniors remain living independently. Thank you. Although we provide an array of services to seniors today, I want to highlight one of those services, our monthly nurses in clinics. These clinics often serve as a gateway service where seniors have their first encounter with our organization, have a chance to talk about health concerns and medications with a registered nurse and get their blood pressure monitored. We hold nurses in clinics at eight community locations. Our newest location is the Somali Senior Center. We also hold clinics at the American Indian Center, 
Korean Service Center, Brian Coyle Community Center, two subsidized apartment buildings, a senior housing cooperative, a local church, and our office. As needed, our nurse may follow up with individuals seen at the clinics and do a home nursing visit, which may include a fall prevention assessment and a vision consultation. Or we may match a senior we meet through the clinics with a friendly visitor or transportation volunteer. We reach a number of people of color through our nurses in clinics, particularly Somali, African American, Native American, and Asian seniors. Of the 618 seniors we served uh, last year, uh, about a third were people of color. To better meet the unique needs of Somali seniors who live in our community, we're working with a Somali cultural consultant to enhance outreach to Somali elders. We expect to serve an additional 800 plus Somali seniors next year. We so appreciate the financial support you have given our program and ask you to consider increasing funding for aging support services in 2020. Thank you. Thank you. We have Freya Richmond next, and then just if people want to queue, um, the person after after Freya is Brandon Burbach. Welcome, Freya. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, I am Freya Richmond. I come here uh, representing the Trans Equity Council. And first, I would like to um, acknowledge the vision and um, and the hard work of Vice President Councilperson Jenkins and Councilperson Cunningham for making that body a reality. Um, both the work group and the Transgender Equity Council are, uh, are vital if we intend to keep equity as a focal point of, of our work here at the city, um, the Transgender Equity Council is an essential body to that, to that effort. And uh, I, I had the opportunity and the honor to serve on that, on that body in its last session. And at that time, we came and we asked the budget committee to um, continue to fund the TEC um, for their work um, and to fund a staff person who can be a, a, a go-between the, the committee and the city. And we came through. We managed to make that happen. Um, it's not an ongoing um, line item, um, so we're here again to ask for that uh, to be approved again for what we're looking for is a full-time staff person and money to support the work of the Transgender Equity Council. Um, the co budget committee did the right thing um, last last round, um, and I'm, I know that you'll be able to, to find the money again. And then looking forward to find a way to keep that uh, as a permanent line item. So. Thank, Thank you, you very much. You. Brandon Burbach, and after Brandon, Chris Hewitt. Welcome. Good morning. Thanks for taking time to hear my comments. Um, I, I live in North Minneapolis. I've been there 15 years. Uh, there's a lot of crime in my neighborhood. Um, my house has been robbed. My car has been stolen. My cars get broken into. Uh, this is not uncommon. My neighbors deal with this, too. Um, a lot of 911 calls don't get answered because we don't have enough, uh, you know, uh, uh, bandwidth in that system. And I think it's because we don't fund our police. I shouldn't have to be here right now. Uh, like the vast majority of Minneapolis residents, I should be at school. I should be at home taking care of my kids. I should be at work. I work at the University of Minnesota. I'm a cancer researcher. I should be studying cancer right now. But I feel like I have to be here to kind of watchdog you guys because I'm frustrated. Our city's grown by tens of thousands of residents and uh, we have thousands of high density housing units and we're reluctant to approve just 14 more police officers for a city that's growing. It's a small fraction of what the police chief asked for and if I wasn't dodging cars that are, you know, literally crashing on our sidewalks and in the neighbors' houses, I um, would. I, I don't know what I'd be doing. Um, I, 
I'd be laughing because, you know, this is really sad. You guys float press releases suggesting that we need to raise taxes 6% on a $1.6 billion budget to pay for police. And we never hear you ask for tax increases to pay for a lot of dubious uh, items like the Office for Banning Plastic Bags and the Office for International Aid and the Office for Sidewalk Festivals. I get it. There's a lot of important things to do. And uh, believe me, I know that there's social challenges to increasing the, the good use of a police force, but public safety comes first. I can't think of any better way to erode trust in government than for you to pass a budget that fails to put law enforcement first. Please return this budget to the mayor and ask for a fully funded traffic unit and a community officer for every neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Hewitt and then Michael Rainville. Hello, and uh, I just wanted to do a brief here. Uh, I feel that this is a great, diverse, and progressive city uh, that is open to everyone, but I also fear we're at a tipping point. Crime is up and traffic problems are getting worse. The number one job of any city is to make sure its citizens are safe, and right now I believe we are falling short. I was here just a couple of months ago talking about how Allstate ranked us 136 out of 200 against other cities, down from 56 in 2012 before the elimination of the Traffic Enforcement Division using accidents and those without uh, car insurance in their analysis. The people of this city are effectively being taxed with higher car insurance costs due to the extreme high number of drivers driving without car insurance. I compared rates based on zip code at carinsurance.com yesterday. The rate is 20% higher on average or $327 per year more than if I lived a few minutes to the west in Robbinsdale. This does not even take into account all the hit and runs, pedestrians, bicyclists hit, cars going into buildings, and so on. Per Vision Zero, pedestrians make up only 20% of all the trips taken in Minneapolis, yet they bear 30% of the injuries and deaths. Bikers, meanwhile, only account for 5% of all trips, and they represent 15 to 20% of all traffic-related deaths. One area often overlooked is that the MPD is often the first ones to the scene of an accident, a house fire, or a person in medical distress. These first responders often save lives and make sure the scene is safe so that fire and EMTs can do their jobs. I witnessed this firsthand at an accident scene close to my home a few months back. Yes, adding police is cost to the city budget. The problem is, for years, the city has not kept up with growing population, and now we have to play catch up. We all know, or we should know, the numbers. Last year, between July 1st and June 30th of this year, over 6,700 times when somebody picked up the phone and called 911 for a priority one call, there was no squad available to go at that time. These are real issues, and I just want everybody to pay attention to that, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Michael Rainville and then Tabitha Montgomery. Good morning, Madam Chair. My name is Michael Rainville. I live in the Third Ward, and I'm here today to, uh, number one, thank you for your service, because uh, public service, I, I know how much of your personal life is sacrificed by serving our community, and really public service is second only to the clergy for helping our community, so thank you for what you do. I'm here to support Chief Irredondo and the mayor's request for more police. Uh, I think that we have the best chief of police in North America, African-American of the city. He's a 30-year veteran. Please listen to him when he asks for more police. And lastly, I, I want to challenge you. I read in the paper of a, a woman, a county commissioner, either from Seattle or Portland, who came here to study our housing, because she said that Minneapolis does affordable housing the best of any city in the, in the country. And she came here to study your efforts. Why can't you put that effort and knowledge that you have into community relationships with the police department? You can do it. People should come here to study why we have such a great relationship with our police department and citizens. So that's my challenge to you. Thank you for giving me your time today. Thank you. Michael, um, sorry, Tabitha Montgomery and then Grace Burke. Welcome. Uh, good morning, Council. My name is Tabitha Montgomery. I serve the Powderhorn Park Neighborhood Association, and I scrapped my speech. I think most of you know, and I have been in contact, that I uh, s 
support the South Minneapolis Public Safety Coalition call for a $10 million investment in what we believe are holistic public safety resources to stem this tide in livability uh, and safety occurrences in a broad swath of communities across the city. And yet, as I sit in this chamber, I find myself being asked to pit my views and my priorities against everyone in this chamber, and it's inappropriate. I believe that we're talking about the wrong issue. $1.6 billion for a city with over 400,000 citizens is simply not enough. If that were to equate to about $3,700 per, per citizen, that should tell you it simply is not enough. Safety is important. Health and human services are important. Everything that every person that's going to come to this podium and tell you that needs to be funded should be funded full stop. We have to do better. And that starts with you helping us to understand the full cost. I implore you to be more honest than where you have been today. You can push back and go to the mayor and say, not only do we need the budget that we're going to implement, we need the budget that gives the citizenry a full understanding and accounting of what it will need and take for us to be a functioning municipality. We are not functioning when we have vacancy rates hovering around 2%. We are not functioning when we have an opioid crisis and we spend months and months having a mayor's opioid task force with 18 recommendations and 51 tactics and doesn't nobody know the cost. We are not functioning when in, you're going to end 2018 pass a strategic racial equity action plan with three pillars that everybody in this chamber agree with and you do not know the full cost. We have to get beyond platitudes and telling us that these things are important down to cultural districts if you do not know what it's going to take to implement it. Enough is enough. Thank you, um, Grace Burke, and then it's beautiful handwriting, but a little hard to read. Doris Overby, I think it's speaker number nine. Welcome, Grace. Thank you, and good morning, Council. Uh, my name is Grace Berkey, and I'm here this morning um, as a renter in Ventura Village, as a representative of the Powderhorn Park Neighborhood Association with Tabitha and the South Minneapolis Public Safety Coalition. Um, we're part of that coalition and are here this morning advocating for fully funded, holistic, and community-centered solutions to improve safety and livability, particularly for areas of the city that experience a disproportionate amount of overdoses, homelessness, and other livability concerns. I urge you all to consider ways in which the city of Minneapolis can invest in upstream and early intervention resources to create a healthier and safer community. And when you choose to invest in our communities, I urge you to be serious about the true cost of creating the kind of community that we envision and to fully fund those programs and initiatives. There are corridors and communities in the city that have been under-resourced year after year, and I do not believe that partially funded pilots and programs are enough to materially change the lived experiences of people in those communities. Um, Tabitha referenced a, a proposal that we are working on with the South Minneapolis Public Safety Coalition for a $10 million um, investment in fully funded street level resources to improve safety and livability. And in general, we just urge you to, like I said, invest in holistic strategies and community centered strategies and to fully fund those um, this budget season. Thank you. Thank you. Doris Overby and then Mark Anderson. Welcome. My name is Doris Overby, and I live in the Standish Erickson neighborhood. Uh, I've lived there for over 45 years. I'm here to support Chief Rondo and his request for additional police officers. In my opinion, our chief is the best, smartest, most empathetic chief that we have ever had, plus he grew up in South Minneapolis. My council member is Andrew Johnson, and he has done great work for our ward. Thank you. I hear from our neighbors that more police officers are needed. We have break-ins, garage break-ins, house break-ins, car break-ins. I think that navigator teams and engagement teams are important to all of our neighborhoods. However, police are the people that we need for our safety concerns. They are not social workers. Thank you. Thank you, we have Mark Anderson and then Lisa Clemens. Good morning, my name is Mark Anderson. I'm uh, Executive Director of Barbara Schneider Foundation. 
Barb died in a police call, the year 2000, Abuka Sanders as well. That's how I got involved in this. Uh, I have some data here from Minnesota Department of Health I'd like to share with you, and I probably can't uh, pass it out, but I make copies here. I'll leave them up here. Um, in the state of Minnesota, 2000 to 2017, number of opioid deaths is 10 times, has increased 10 times. Number of alcohol attributable deaths has doubled in those 17 years. Number of suicides, state of Minnesota has doubled. I just learned this morning we lost two, two police officers in Minnesota in the last 24 hours to suicide. Um, it's, a, it's about crisis. Who do we send into crisis? We send our police officers. Uh, all too often what I hear from officers is, uh, we, we don't have time to de-escalate. That's what we work on. We work on a model called CIT, Crisis Intervention Team. Best practice uh, by, uh, by SAMHSA for diverting people from the criminal justice system to the mental health system. Uh, we're doing it here in, Minnesota, in, uh, in Minneapolis. Uh, Chief, Chief Ferradano is a big supporter. Uh, it's about partnering police, mental health, and community advocacy. It's a difficult partnership, but it works. It's, it's a way we can improve the way we respond to crisis in our communities. But when officers say, we don't have time for this, breaks my heart. Uh, officers tell me they don't care about us. The city doesn't care about us. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I was, uh, I was on a call uh, 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 giving a, uh, uh, keeping an infant alive and uh, uh, attending to this infant, the EMS came, took the child away, and then I had to go on the next call. I said, did anyone talk to you? Was there any debriefing, Mr. any Anderson, counseling, anything? I need you. No, to nothing was offered. Comments. I'm happy to let you submit the rest of your comments to the clerk. Could you please give the papers that you put on the on the stand there to the clerk and we'll make sure that we all receive it and that it's included in the public record. Lisa Clemens and then Nora Bradford. I'm sorry, sir, that was your two minutes. People say that that uh, they know it's a Mr. dangerous Anderson. job. Uh, Mr. Anderson, I, I need to respect. It's your ask job to, to give them a safe work environment. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Clemens. So I'm going to say two things and I'll try to be quick. I really want you to look at your cadet program and fund it. I left the Minneapolis Police Department in 2001. There were six black women on that department. It is 2019, there's eight. That is the one way that you bring people of color into your department. So if you're serious about diversity, that is the route to go. Now to the 14 cops, I support it. But I wanna to say to everybody sitting in this room, we all want one thing, and that's safety in our community. You have a lot of agencies or organizations or departments, whatever you're calling them, under your umbrella that's not just the police. But you always call us to come in here or them to speak against police funding. If you take 1% from every department that you're funding, and put it into a coffer account, whatever you want to call it, to fund all of the things the people in this room want to do, you will have more than what you keep trying to siphon off the police. It's easy to pit us against the police. So I'm asking you to do your due diligence. Look at the money you spend for all agencies, including the fire department. Everybody should have a role in public safety and for us to be able to do the work in our communities. You have the money. It's easy. It is the easiest thing in the world for y'all to come out and tell us to come in here and speak against the police department's budget. And I say you are a divider in our community when you should be uniting us. I'm looking at a picture with Trump in it. What is he? A divider of the people. The city council is a divider. You all have your base that you play to. And I'm saying to you guys, ask them how much they spend to fund all of these departments and sub-departments. Give us 1% out of all of their money 
so that we can fund the work that we do in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clemens. Nora Bradford and then George Glover. Welcome. <clears throat> Good morning, City Council. My name is Nova Bradford. I'm a mental health professional in Minneapolis, and I was the co-chair of the inaugural uh, Minneapolis Transgender Equity Council. I'm here today to ask, um, we requested in a previous budget hearing to have a line item for a part-time staff person for the Transgender Equity Council. That was granted. By any possible metric, it's been a smashing success. We've had increased engagement with this council, um, partly evidenced by the incredible turnout today of supporters of additional funding. So I'm here once again again to say please if you could renew this small budget item um, to have a staff person for the Transgender Equity Council to increase um, community involvement, liaise between the community, uh, the transgender -like community and the city government and um, facilitate dialogue between all of these different um, disparate groups. We're in a historic time where transgender people's civil rights are under attack at almost every level of government and this is one tangible thing that the city can do to um, enact solidarity and support for our local transgender community. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry I miss said your name, Nova. Thank you for being here. George Glover and then Darren Gaines. Good morning. My name is George Glover. I work for the Minneapolis Marriott City Center downtown and I'm here to talk about safety in downtown. I've noticed over the last five years I've lost, <clears throat> well not lost, I've created, I've been with the Marriott 31 years. I've created uh, a great relationship with a lot of police officers that used to walk the beat downtown. And I can say out of 100% of those guys that I've got to know, it's probably down to 1% of the police that walk around downtown now. I, I don't see police officers anymore moving around. But I've noticed a lot more aggressive young teens. I've noticed a lot more aggressive panhandling. And I'm going through it every day that I come to work where we're being spit on, sometimes phys physically challenged. That's all I gotta say, this is all new to me. And we do need more officers on the street. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Glover. Darren Gaines and then Baki Porter. Good Go afternoon, Council. <clears throat> I too also work at the uh, Marriott City Center. I'm from the I live in the seven ward. <clears throat> um, we do need more of a police presence. <clears throat> Sometimes I feel like I'm the police because I'm the doorman. Uh, a lot of kids come downtown, you know, start fights, uh, homelessness, and we got a lot of buildings and stuff that's coming up right now. So we need more presence. We got more people living here. Um, they have no problem touring cars giving tickets, and I just, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, just wish for more police presence. Because a lot of police, they seem like they're afraid to do their job because they're getting criticized all the time because of what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Baki Porter, and then Yolanda Harris, welcome. <laughs> I want to thank y'all, and I want to thank y'all ancestors for bringing y'all here today. Please thank mine. Every day I wake up and I tell myself it's a good day to be black, it's a good day to be native, it's a good day to be trans, it's a good day to be a youth. I do this just not because affirmations are good for one's spirit, but because my city's infrastructure tells me otherwise. <laughs> If you follow the paper, if you follow the pain, if you follow the pollution, you, t you tell me folks like me don't matter. <laughs> There's people in, from North Minneapolis asking for more police when historically police have only hurt us. Y'all took Jamar from us. Y'all took Philando from us. Y'all are hurting our communities. There's toxins in our soil. There's lead in our water. And you wonder why we're all depressed. You wonder why we can't get our act together. Everyone's calling for safety, but police have only hurt me. They have only choked out my mother. They have only cussed me out. They have only physically abused people like me. It makes me sad that other people in my community are asking for a more police presence when what they need is safety. We do not need more slave catchers. We do not need more slave catchers. We do not need more slave catchers. We do not need more slave catchers, please. 
<laughs> they were telling us that youth are the problem. When we are the symptoms of it, we're experiencing homelessness. We're experiencing pollution. Our school systems are taking our art away from us. I'm sitting here in pain. My stomach's in knots. Like, we don't need cops. They took so much away from us. If you care about the people, if everyone in this room cares about love and safety and care, we need public housing. We need food justice. We have to do something for Gaia. I promise you, I swear to God, I swear to Gaia, we take care of each other and the earth and we'll all be okay. Please don't add more police. I swear to God, please don't add more police. Thank you. Yolanda, hair, and then Sheila Nez head. My name is Yolanda, and I live in the sixth ward. Today, a few of us from Reclaim the Block are going to share our vision for the city. We know that you all didn't write the budget we're looking at today. Mayor Fry handed it to you, and now you get to work with it. We are counting on you to work with us to keep shaping it into the budget that will build a city where we're all actually safe, where black and brown people are safe, queer and trans people are safe, and immigrants are safe. We're not here because we're in denial about the real problems in our city. We're here because we know how serious these problems are. We see the gun violence, the domestic violence, the racism, the addictions and the overdoses, the lack of affordable housing. We know how serious these problems are, but 50 years of trying to um, solve them with more and more police has not solved them. It's just landed more black and brown people behind bars. It's moved the problems from block to block year after year. We're here because we are very, very serious about solutions. We've been talking to neighbors, researching other cities, and dreaming about the kind of Minneapolis we want to live in. We want to partner with you all to take some steps towards that kind of Minneapolis. The first step we're asking you to take with us is not a new one. Thanks to the work of Councilmember Cunningham and Councilmember Fletcher last year, the council moved $1.1 million to the Office of Violence Permission prevention and other critical programs that address the root causes of these issues. This year, we want to keep building on that momentum. We're asking you to make a significant ongoing investment in the Office of Violent Prevention's work so the office has a chance to deliver on its potential without having to wonder whether they'll have funding from year to year. Thank you. Thank you. Sheila Neshad and then Jehon Shim. Hello, council members. My name is Sheila, and I live in the central neighborhood, and I'm a member of Reclaim the Block. So housing is an urgent need for many, many people in our city, and last year's investments were an important step, but that's what they were, a first step. The second step we're asking you to take with us is to make a major investment in youth homelessness services. Young people between 16 and 24 often fall through the cracks of existing programs. They can get turned away from both youth and adult shelters. And when we hear sensationalized media reports about young people engaged in crime, we need to ask, why is that happening? What is causing that? We know that housing creates a foundation of stability for young people. For young people who have already been arrested, research shows that affordable, supportive housing slashes the likelihood that they'll be arrested again. Stable homes, stable schools is a good start, but only meets the needs of 20% of youth experiencing homelessness. Given the scale of youth homelessness and its impact on public safety, it's clear it needs greater investment. So let's make an investment proportional to the crisis and invest in homelessness services for youth, not more funding for police to harass and arrest them. Thank you. Thank you. Jehun and then Luna Gabrielle. Welcome. Hello, Council. My name is Jehan Shim. I live at 2919 14th Avenue South. The opioid crisis is hitting our communities hard. It's hit me hard. A little over three years ago, I was prescribed opiates to deal with a chronic pain condition. A little under two years ago, my life was saved by Narcan. In 2018, there were over 950 overdose calls to 911. 
just in Minneapolis. That number has consistently been increasing every year. The third step we're asking you to take with us is invest in solutions for the opioid crisis at the scale of the opioid crisis itself. Mayor Fry's budget proposes 400,000 new dollars for opioid initiatives. That's a drop in the bucket compared to what is actually needed. And the new safe disposal boxes that were just installed are a really great tool, but that's not one of the recommendations that was handed down and we would like to have those fully funded from the opioid task force that was created. They put in a lot of work and they have wonderful recommendations listed out for you. We also want you to farm harm reduction activities. We have organizations in our community who are delivering Narcan, training people how to use it, providing safe injection kits, and saving people's lives every day. And we want them to be funded so that they can continue doing that work, not on volunteer time, not on shoestring budgets. Our 911 operators are regularly fielding calls about overdoses, the priority one calls that currently demand police attention. And if we're concerned about 911 response times, then we need to be doing things to reduce these calls even coming into them in the first place. This is about prevention. And this crisis is a public health crisis. This is not something that the police should be overseeing. This belongs with the public health department and with the community to decide how these dollars are used. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Luna, Gabrielle, Candace Montgomery, and then after that will be Cops Full Cult. It's, it's speaker number 21. Thank Thanks. you. Welcome. Um, my name is Luna Gabrielle, and I'm here with Reclaim the Block. Um, one of the steps that we're actually asking y'all to take uh, with us is to improve how we handle mental health crisis. When our neighbors are in a mental health crisis, they need a mental health response team, not police. We are asking the police, uh, we are asking the police to do too much when asking them to become experts in handling mental health emergencies. <clears throat> Let's look outside of the police department for professional, cultural, culturally relevant emergency responses. MPD has a track record of killing community members when they respond to mental health calls, and the result is that many people just don't call the help when their loved ones are in a crisis. I heard someone earlier say that police officers are not um, social workers, and that is exactly why they shouldn't be used in that space. Um, but there are actually successful models that we can learn from. In Eugene, Oregon, uh, they have a program called CAHOOTS. When someone calls 911 about a mental health crisis, the dispatcher sends an EMT and a mental health professional instead of the police officer. Everyone in that situation wins because a person in crisis gets a professional care from a mental health expert rather than the police, and the program diverts about 17% of the 911 calls away from the police. Since people are worried about 911 uh, response times, this approach seems common sense for Minneapolis as well. Um, the fifth step we're asking you to take with us is to step, uh, step up enforcement for wage theft laws and invest in protecting workers in our community. Um, we build safety by providing stable jobs where people know they can rely on their paycheck. Employers target black and brown workers disproportionately for wage theft. While these communities get profiled as the perpetrators of crime, they're actually the ones most victimized by corporate wage theft, a much more significant threat than property theft, to be exact three to four times more likely. We ask that Minneapolis hire an additional investigator for the Labor Standards Enforcement Division and invest $100,000 in community contacts towards outwork, outreach and worker education. Thank you. Thank you. We have Candace Montgomery, Cobbs, or maybe it should, Cobby Foucault, and then TVW Nels. Welcome. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Candace Montgomery. I live at 3636 Park Avenue. Um, I'm here with Reclaim the Block and I'm also the executive director of Black Visions Collective. Um, <clears throat> the, the final piece I'd like to say here is um, Minneapolis has enough money to pay for every solution that we've outlined today. But we have to stop allowing the police budget to balloon year after year unchecked. In the past 10 years, MPD's budget has grown faster than our city's budget as a whole. We can pay for programs like these if we don't hire 14 new police officers this year and if we don't give MPD an $8.4 million raise. Bob Kroll and the police union have shown us that they stand with Donald Trump, not our communities. Um, and I just want to say that this is, goes so far beyond being anti-police. Um, this actually goes, this is connected to being pro our communities. This is about being pro um, our future. 
right? Um, and we need to stop juxtaposing those things and start living into a sentiment of abundance, um, that we have what we need. In the next month, you'll hear from a lot of residents about how serious the safety concerns are in their neighborhoods. We know that drugs, violence, unstable housing and homelessness, mental health crises, so many other issues are threatening the well-being of our community members. We ask that when you hear these stories, you ask yourselves, how can we spend the money to actually tackle the root causes of this problem? Not just push the problem around to another neighbor neighborhood or criminalize it or put it off until next year, but really, we need to start chipping away at the root causes now. Not because safety isn't important, but because it is critically important. Minneapolis can be a city where all of us have high quality housing and livable wages, and where rates of overdose and addiction go down instead of where people feel, instead, and where people feel safe in their neighborhoods. Small, one-time budget allocations won't make this happen, neither will investing in the same system of criminalization and policing that we've been doing for hundreds of years. We're asking you to join us by investing in real solutions. We're Thank trusting you. you to take these steps with us. Thank you. Cops or Kabi, and then T V W N E L Z S. I'm sorry, you can help me pronounce your name when you get to the podium. And then Cordell Franklin. Welcome. Hi, my name's Cobbs. I'm a lifelong Minneapolis resident. I live in the East Phillips neighborhood. I'm here as a member of Southside Harm Reduction Services. Um, I'm here to talk about the city's response to the opioid crisis. Uh, I'm part of a group that distributes um, naloxone, safe injection supplies uh, through home delivery and street outreach. Uh, we provide referral, referrals to treatment programs when people are ready to take that step. Um, People who utilize syringe access programs are drastically more likely to uh, decide to go to treatment. Um, we offer a non-judgmental, non sympathetic ear, and we have a lot of trust that we've built in the drug using community over the last few years. Uh, we're all volunteer run. We manage to be out at least four nights a week, uh, and we do this with really minimal funding, mostly through one-time grants and money that we raise through grassroots. Um, last night I was out doing deliveries till about midnight. I took in over 2,000 used syringes. Um, that's before they hit the ground. Um, it's directly receiving them back from drug users before they get in, disposed improperly. I gave out clean syringes and naloxone. Um, there's pretty much not a night that I'm out that I don't hear someone say how them or a loved one would be dead without the naloxone they got from us. Um, something else I hear unfortunately commonly is traumatic and negative experiences people have had with the police. I talk to people who are facing paraphernalia charges for carrying clean syringes and for cleaning up dirty syringes in their neighborhood, causing people to reuse and share syringes and not properly dispose of them. This leads to the dirty syringes in public places, but more importantly to the spread of Hep C, Hep A, HIV, syphilis, and deadly bacterial infections. Uh, the proposed budget, the city is mostly looking to fund brand new programs and a police position instead of acknowledging the work that's being done and succeeding with little to no funding. Um, we need, in this year alone, we've put 10,000 doses of naloxone on the street. Um, I would like to suggest that y'all acknowledge Thank what you. we're doing already and fund Thank programs you. that exist. We so appreciate what you do, Cubs. Thank you. TV, speaker number 22. T-V-W-E-N-E-L-Z-S, welcome. Help me pronounce your name. Hi, everybody. My name is Tanels Bay. I'm here on be uh, behalf of Kaiser, I mean, not Kaiser Permanent, it's Seitul, and we're just here to address the, uh, disregarding the proposal of birth, uh, police. In regards to, they use utilize color law and birth rights theft in regards to using color code caste systems, this is my own personal belief. It is all known that we're Morris Americans as well as, well as Morris, as well as uh, not color, I mean black, white, or any other color, color that uh, there's all just one nation, that's the human nation, and that all these are color code caste systems that separates, I mean separates, separates the human family and causes uh, divide and conquer tactics that, that we can't really resolve in our uh, communities. And there should be no reason why we can't address these in our communities as this is a common unity that we would like to address in regards to our own safety and public matters because at the end of the day, there's all intermixing in regards to everywhere. And um, it's just a shame that we can't go to the elders and those, uh, those that know right and address these without them providing you with semantic deceit that's uh, based off of 
uh, slavery or peonage and other subject matters. But in regards to our communities, if I feel like if we band together and uh, promote education in regards to law and how that applies to our history and how those are tied together, it should be no reason why our communities are suffering all these things that we, all of us as a, together can a tackle and as well as embrace because it's not really nothing new under the sun but we just rack, lack references or those that's willing to shed the light on those things and I thank you for your time. Thank you Tainos. We have Cordell Franklin, Kristen Womack, and Davis Sensiman next. If you want to go ahead and line up behind each other that will help cut down on our in between time between speakers. We have over 80 people signed up to speak. Welcome. Um, Peace to the city of Minneapolis. Uh, my name is Cordell Franklin and I stay on Broadway in Lindale. And um, my own personal experience is I've worked in construction and I've worked in a few fields in which I've experienced wage theft. And um, it causes me to feel a certain type of way. And I, be believe, I strongly believe that a lot of the crime is done by people who have been taken from and lack resources to do better. So instead of investing in 14 more police officers, I strongly believe that you should um, invest in uh, the community organizations that we have uh, present today and that are trying to um, provide safety in our communities versus spread um, the fear and terror that I do believe that the police promote because I feel like they have other ways that they can um, do what they do their job without hiring more police officers and um, with wage theft I believe that wage theft occurs more commonly than property theft and that um, we should uh, fund organizations like say tool that enforce wage theft laws and are out there doing the outreach because I didn't hear about wage theft um, uh, if it wasn't for a say tool worker doing the outreach so I strongly believe that it's important that we invest in our community organizations than organizations that are uh, historically known to hurt the community and threaten the community that's all thank you thank you Kristen Womack Davis Sensiman and then Barbara Janetta welcome Kristen thank you hi my name is Kristen Womack and I'm a resident and business owner of Ward 1 I'm here today to testify in support for the request to fund two full-time year-round permanent trans equity staff roles starting with the 2020 budget my daughter Nora is transgender and I am so proud of her I can't tell you how many times my spouse and I have counted our good fortune of living in Minnesota. We've had resources when we needed them, particularly when na navigating her name change in connection with her student ID and school policies. Lucky for us, there was a lot of groundwork laid before we stepped onto this path, but we're not done. Progress is not the same as equality. We have more to do. Without representation of trans people at the level of policy ma making, we lack representation. Not just elected officials, but staff members. And not just at the state level, but at the city level. I became aware of the Trans Equity Council at Pride. I went to the Trans Equity Summit. And both of these things were amazing. And their work is only possible because it was prioritized and there was a budget. But it's not just the summit and pride, it's policy and restrooms and police training and school safety and equity for transgender and gender nonconforming people in all of our city. We must have representation for all citizens of Minneapolis and particularly adults and youth that are most at risk or impacted by lack of representation. My daughter is a citizen and deserves to have equity and representation all transgender citizens deserve to have equity, civil rights, and protections in Minneapolis. These services are not free. Cost and price are very different things, though, and the value of this representation at the city level will yield more value that is particularly critical for the basic equity of transgender citizens. The cost is too high to not have these roles approved. Thank, Thank you. you for hearing my testimony. Thank you, Kristen. Next is Davis Sensiman, and then Barbara Janetta, and then Kevin Lewis. Welcome. Um, my name is Davis Sensman, and I'm a resident and business owner in Ward 1 and a parent of two MPS um, students. I'm here today to request that the City of Minneapolis budget include funding for two full-time year-round permanent trans equity staff roles, starting with the 2020 budget. 
Significant disparities still exist in this country for trans citizens in virtually all areas, including employment, health care, safety, housing, and access to public spaces. Federal cases threatening our livelihoods and safety are currently being heard in the Supreme Court. Violence against trans individuals, particularly trans women of color, continues to rise. Ensuring that our city is addressing the needs of the trans community, which includes members from all of our most marginalized communities, will improve our city for everyone. With full-time positions, Minneapolis can maintain its position on the forefront of working towards equity for trans citizens and providing services for parents like Kristen by engaging all of our community members. Without full-time positions, which exist for nearly all other city committees, the city forces members of the community who already face discrimination and marginalization in employment settings to take on this work for little or no compensation. Part-time positions are not sustainable and making our city equitable for the trans community is certainly not a part-time workload. This year's Trans Equity Summit was the largest, most accessible, and most community-planned summit to date. It was also the first to compensate speakers and breakout session presenters, and that would not have been possible without a staff member, albeit a half-time staff member. If this council is truly committed to equity and success for all members of this city, including our trans community, I would ask that you demonstrate that value through fully funding to full-time, year-round, permanent trans equity staffers to allow both the summit and other vital community outreach to be fully realized. Thank you. Thank you, Davis. Barbara Janetta, Kevin Lewis, and then Steve Kramer. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you for taking time to listen to all of us uh, this morning. I'm Barb Janetta. I live in the 8th Ward. I'm the director of Alliance Housing. We own about 500 units of affordable housing in the city of Minneapolis, and I'm a member of the Make Homes Happen Coalition. This month, Alliance is moving seven Alliance tenants and 37 homeless adults over the age of 55 into Minnehaha Commons in the Longfellow neighborhood. Thank you very much for the one million plus city uh, affordable housing trust fund dollars that it took to leverage another seven million in state, county, and federal home loan bank dollars to make that happen. 100% of the money that funds that project is deferred debt. We don't pay a monthly mortgage payment. And <clears throat> it's the only way to make that property affordable for these men and women who live on Social Security disability, general assistance, or low and erratic rate wages. I applaud the mayor and council for the 2019 and 2020 uh, housing budgets. They're higher than uh, past years. But I'm worried and concerned about the future and the long term. As you all know, the housing crisis isn't a one and done or two and done uh, situation. Working adults and families continue to struggle to make their wages match the rising cost of housing. And people on a fixed income honestly don't have a chance in this housing market. Make Homes Happen encourages the city to identify a new dedicated ongoing revenue source for funding housing preservation, production, and tenant protections. People with stable housing are proven to have much less draw on public safety uh, concerns. And we're prepared to step up and support you at the legislature in getting authority for more tools that you currently don't have. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, Barbara. Kevin Lewis, Steve Kramer, and then Jim Meyer. Welcome. Welcome. Madam Chair, Council Members, I'm Kevin Lewis. I'm the President and CEO of BOMA, which is the Building Owners and Managers Association in Minneapolis. Uh, so our members own and, and operate the commercial buildings that that have uh, over 200,000 employees in downtown Minneapolis. Uh, two things, first of all, we know the budget process is extraordinarily complicated and there's a lot of asks there. And the other observation is the remarkable work that a lot of people from the different community groups, social groups and so on, to hear some of the things that they're doing voluntarily or as a collective group are really staggering. So uh, kudos to all those in, in the particular room. Um, we do support the mayor's uh, request for 14 additional officers. From the business standpoint, I'll cite an example. Uh, e e ECMC is a business that moved into downtown Minneapolis from Oakdale about three years ago, brought 500 employees to our area. When they asked why, the number one reason is the vibrancy, and number two was the transportation options. And they said, what are the two things that have been 
the most difficult for your employees, and each of the panelists said number one was safety, and number two was parking, for that matter. Um, so safety is a real concern for a, a lot of our members, their tenants, and the employees that they have. As a citizen of the state of Minnesota, um, safety is crucial. You've heard many times the 911 calls, and yes, they might be because of something uh, from a safety or a crime is being committed, but let's not forget the o opioids or the overdose that we've heard countless times so far today. Car accidents, a child choking or something. These are what the police officers do as well as preventing crime. So um, just to see the, a police officer playing chess with a citizen down in the Nickel Mall, that's a really refreshing thing. Uh, so on behalf of our members, we support the mayor's uh, request for 14 additional officers. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Steve Kramer, followed by Jim Meyer, followed by Shore Salkas. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is, and members of the committee, my name is Steve Kramer. I'm president and CEO of the Minneapolis Downtown Council and Downtown Improvement District. So we work in partner with the city on a, a wide variety of issues on behalf of our business uh, membership to support a, a growing and vibrant downtown. I was last year, just as an example, on the Hennepin Streetscape program. But there's no issue that, uh, that we face together that's more important to the future of our downtown, of our city, than public safety. That's true for downtown, it's true for neighborhoods throughout Minneapolis. Um, we forged a number of uh, very effective partnerships on a wide variety of strategies, preventative strategies, outreach programs, long-term solutions. All, all of them are important and they're all part of the, the, uh, the mix of things that we need to do together to make our, down, our uh, community safe. But we're at a point in time when investment in the police department is, is essential. MPD is simply stretched too thin to play its role in that continuum of strategies as effectively as it needs to be played. So we're here to stand with the chief and his vision for a more community-based, uh, more proactive, uh, different cultured police department, uh, as well as uh, the mayor's proposal to invest in that direction. So thank you for your time and for your consideration. Thank you, Jim Meyer, Shore Salkas, and Katie Cuerna. Welcome. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and all the valued members of the Minneapolis City Council who I've had the pleasure to meet in the past year in my dealings here. Uh, I'm Jim Meyer, long time, uh, born and raised, longtime resident on 51st Chicago, Ward 11. I'm also um, an LPN at the Veterans Home Domiciliary Unit where we support. Uh, it's the adult transitional job reentry, chemical uh, recovery, mental health, and all of those areas. I'm also a recorder for the three pack, uh, third, pre third precinct advisory, not because I'm Blue Lives Matter or so hardcore or so staunch, but just to learn how the force works, uh, some ins and outs, and to hear from neighbors. Uh, it's not dominated by people out near Diamond Lake. It's more people around Corcoran, Lake Street, north of, and they are in anguish. I really feel for them. Um, I'm not really here with an agenda on a budget number or a right and wrong or, or whatever. It's way beyond me. I trust you to do what's right. But um, I get a sense that there's a belief that the crime is down and people are sticking to that story and I'm just, I, I can't really believe it. 2018 was a big outlier with the Super Bowl security um, and all the attendant high surveillance, which has been an ongoing concern at that time and now, which I understand. Uh, the long, cold winter spring, then the tent city and the navigation center was a effective containment and control, which actually advocates for maybe a supervised use, but that's a different story. Our homicide rate is numerically up. There's no, de there's no debate, right, from last year? Um, and I know that's a bumpy number, but we're up already before Veterans Day. Aggravated assault is up, burglary. I mean, this <laughs> gigantic ring that ran out of 51st Avenue North, maybe they picked on the suburbs, but that's not really a win for Minneapolis. The car shopping, the auto thefts, the till tapping, the store swarming. So um, why are we having all these emergency safety meetings if we don't have this problem? Or why build a fence around Cedars? I'm very interested with my neighbors from all sides in some innovative, efficient change and reform. I just hope we just do it honestly and in togetherness and cooperatively and respectfully. Thank you very much also to Mary Albrecht for Healthy Seniors for speaking up. Thank you. Shore Salkas, Katie Cuerna, and Lynn Johnson. <clears throat> Good 
Good morning, council members. Thank you so much for your service. My name is Shore, like the North Shore or the Seashore. My pronouns are they, them, their, or my name, and I live in Ward 9. Um, I'm also the co-chair of the Trans Equity Council here through the city of Minneapolis. Um, I want to start off by saying that I'm really proud to live in a city that holds up the work of trans equity, of LGBTQ equity, and racial equity um, within the city walls. I think that is incredible, and honestly, it's one of the reasons I moved back to live in Minneapolis. Since I joined the Trans Equity Council um, and have witnessed the work of the Trans Equity Work Group, I have noticed the hard work of so many community members, um, as well as so many staff and many of you on the council to elevate this work. I am so proud to see the growth of the Trans Equity Summit, the growth of community engagement within LGBTQ, trans, and POC communities through Pride events and other forms of community engagement and outreach, that there's work to start an LGBTQ employee resource group within the city, and that this council has been working so hard with you all and with staff to create and dream up a more equitable city government and city. It's truly remarkable. So some of our goals on the Trans Equity Council is to continue growing this work, um, and our hopes for that is further, deeper, more meaningful community engagement and outreach. We want to continue bringing our communities together at the Trans Equity Summit, and we want to continue doing really deep and meaningful systems change work through the subcommittees of the council um, and through all of the work that the council is hoping to do. In order to achieve this growth, to achieve further success, we are asking that the city council appoint two positions fully funded to support the work through the city government. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you, sure. Katie Querna, Lynn Johnson, and Judy Hauk. And as Katie's coming up, if Lynn and Judy want to start lining up in the back, it'll help us cut down on our time. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Thanks, City, um, for, for allowing the space. My name is Katie Corna, and I live in Ward 12. Um, I'm a pediatric gender researcher and also a member of the Trans Equity Council. Um, and I moved here not long ago from, um, from a city that fancies itself very progressive and is also deeply invested in the values of capitalism and white supremacy and I was very Seattle and I was very um, thrilled to move to Minneapolis and see that they had an entity um, like the Trans Equity Council. So as a pediatric and adolescent gender researcher my colleagues and I spend much of our days immersed in research and talking to young people and the people who care about them. All of the data that exists suggests that when we allocate material resources, everyone does better. Cis young people, trans young people, cis adults, and trans adults all do better when we invest in queer and trans youth. Much of what has been talked about today is hoping to compel you to care about trans people, recognize a need, and do something about it. Anyone can say that they care, and many people mean it. Caring, saying that we care is not our ask. Our ask is how are we accountable to that care. Just like putting up a Black Lives Matter sign alone is not racial equity work, saying we as a city care about trans people and not materially putting resources towards trans well-being is equivalent. And it's continued violence towards communities of people who already experience disproportionate levels of violence. Funding two positions allows us to ask the question, what world could we create? What kind of equity and well-being could exist if we put our money where our mouth is? Thank you. Thank you. Lynn Johnson and Judy Hauk, followed by Florence Littman. Welcome. Good morning. I'm here representing uh, the Cedar Riverside community. I'm co-chair of the safety center over there. I'm on the court watch for the first precinct, and I'm here to support Chief Rondo's request by the city council today. That's why I'm here. And I really believe that what has happened to our police department is most of them have become the first responders 
in the crisis that's going on in our city. And they can't really go about and do and communicate with the community like they were really meant to do. And that's where the breakdown comes. So being on these different communities and committees that I'm on, I'm passionate about supporting the police department and doing what they're supposed to be doing. And that's supposed to be, they can't communicate with the city because they're so busy responding to the other crises around. And I think it's absolutely important that we support Chief Rondo and his endeavors for the city of Minneapolis. And I'm sure that all the council members would support somebody like that for the safety of their community that they represent. All I can say is that that's why I'm here today to have a conversation. I can't really uh, dialogue much with only two minutes to speak. So, however, uh, I maybe might submit something for the record in writing to all the council members for further. And I want to thank you very much for allowing me to come forward today and support our chief that we have. He's got a real complex job to do. And it's actually been really difficult in the diverse community that we live in. And we have, and Cedar Riverside is a pretty diverse community. And there's a lot of complexities over there that a lot of people don't understand. And we have to make sure that we have proper communication with the community. Thank, Thank you, you then. Right. Next we have Judy Hauk, Florence Littman, and then Vince Nets. Welcome. Good, good morning, council members. I have been a social worker at Southeast Seniors for the past six years. I want to thank you for your support of our program and share a few stories about the positive impact your funding has been at the lives of Southeast C Minneapolis seniors. I'm here to speak on behalf of our senior clients who can't be here today. After 30 years, Southeast seniors is an integral part of our neighborhoods. Seniors trust us, their neighbors trust us, so they call us. Like the neighbors of my client Marie, who they first met by helping her get up from the driveway after a fall. Concerned about her safety, they called us the next day asking if we could help. Our outreach nurse and I met with Marie and the na her neighbors together. After connecting her to an independent case manager and rides to medical appointments by our volunteer drivers, Marie continues to live at home safely. Rosa lives in a subsidized apartment. During my initial home visit, it became apparent that she had profound hearing loss that had never been addressed. English is Rosa's second language, so I was with her every step of the way as she was diagnosed and eventually fitted for a hearing aid. With our support, Rosa continues to live in her Marcy Holmes neighborhood. Antonio, Antonio was a recent short-term client. After a referral, we found him in an emaciated state sleeping on a dirty cot in a back room. Before adult protection needed to intervene, I was able to track down a family member who has since taken him into her home. Esther has lived in Prospect Park home for 50 years, despite advanced macular degeneration. She manages well with the help of our staff and volunteers. Esther remembers when Southeast Seniors was started by our neighbors, wanting to ensure people of all ages could continue to live side by side in their neighborhood. I could go on and on. On behalf of our senior clients and their caregivers, I want to say thank you and encourage your continued support of aging support services in the city budget. I am followed by Florence Littman, one of the neighbors that started Southeast Seniors. Thank you, welcome Florence. After Florence, we have Vince and then Dana Lipper. My name is Florence Lip Littman. I've been living in the same house in Prospect Har Park since 1963. Uh, it's a great place to live. And one of the reasons, many of the reasons that's great, and the thing I'm talking about now is I'm a real life client of Southeast Seniors. And the story I want to tell you happened in 19, uh, um, let's see, uh, 2016. My husband fell. We were out of town at a family get-together for Thanksgiving. He fell on the Friday of Thanksgiving weekend. I hope he doesn't do it this year. And it looks like things were getting bad. So on Saturday, I called Southeast Seniors. I left a message. I said, I think I'm, I'm coming home Monday night. I think we're going to need help. Got off the plane on Monday night. There was a call from the nurse at Southeast Seniors, and she said, the nurse will come tomorrow morning. The nurse called me first, and she said, you've been out of town. You probably need some groceries, don't you? You probably have nothing, you know, no fresh vegetables. And she, brought, she did some grocery shopping for me. 
They do, and they've done a lot more than that. Now, where do you get that sort of service? I mean, that is absolutely amazing. It's a small thing, but you're in trouble, and you have a husband who has fallen and ended up. They helped me through the whole process, through the emergency room, through the hospital, through the transitional care unit, the whole thing. And this has unfortunately been repeated a few times. When I go to the first time I went to a care conference, what did I know about a care conference? As Judy said to me, let me come with you. My problem was I wanted him to stay an extra day till my son who lived abroad was coming. I wanted him there to help. And they didn't want us to stay an extra day, although we, we, we were paying full price. This, was, this wasn't being paid by Medicare because he hadn't been in the hospital for three days. They always see to that. Judy came with me, well, you know, you have a social worker with you. You go to a care conference, that's something else. They were eating out of Judy's hands. Well, of course, no problem. Of course he should stay here until his son gets, no, until his son comes back and helps out. That's been repeated three times also. It's getting to be a habit. We're trying to break that habit. Um, we had a drugstore in our neighborhood that said, government is about making the lives of people better. That's what, and all these other groups are talking about the same thing. Thank you. Thank you. Vince Nutz, Dana Lipper, and then Marcy Zimmerman. Good morning, council members, Madam Chairman. Um, Florence is a tough act to follow. Uh, I'm the executive, interim executive director of Southeast Seniors, a community-based nonprofit that helps seniors stay in their homes healthy, safe, connected, and independent. Uh, we mobilize over 125 volunteers. Uh, we serve over 300 seniors each year. Uh, it's really a glue that holds the neighborhoods together in five neighborhoods on the other side of the river. I'm here today to thank Mayor Fry and you for providing funding for the senior programs and the Aging Support Services line item. Um, and I want to thank David Rubidor for giving a really good case for us at the last budget meeting you had. Um, and I'm also here to ask for more. Uh, as many of you know, uh, the county has cut our funding for the first time in 22 years after our stable contracts. And these are funds that we use to leverage state funding. So that creates a domino effect that puts our program and the other programs in jeopardy. So I'm asking to have you work uh, with the county and with each other to come up with a way to bridge the gap. The gap is 110,000. However you come up with that would be great. Um, and this funding gives a lot of benefits to the community. We, we do blood pressure clinics in public housing. Um, we work with Pratt Community Education to provide uh, uh, workshops on Medicare reform and on uh, pain management. We work with the University of Minnesota and Marcy Open School to connect seniors with youth programs. Um, and we contract with Fairview uh, nursing programs to provide in-home care on a sliding scale to vulnerable adults and people who can't afford it. Finally, we help fulfill the Minneapolis for the Lifetime Plan, especially in post-hospital discharge follow-up that can make the big difference, as Florence pointed out, and getting home again after a hospital stay uh, that helps seniors stay can continue living at home safely. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. Next, we have Dana Lipper, Marcy Zimmerman, Marcy Zimmerman, and Leah So. Hi, my name is Dana Lipper. I live at the intersection of Park and 42nd Street in Ward 8. I stand here today with two asks. First, to fund two full-time year-round year permanent trans equity staff. Secondly, I stand here in support of Reclaim the Block, asking you to divest from the MPD budget and reallocate the money for 14 cops into the Office of Violence Prevention. To me, violence prevention would include people who are trained in de-escalation without guns. It would be money going into de domestic violence prevention work. Unfortunately, there have been times in my neighborhood where I am a bystander to potential domestic violence. I want there to be something that I can do and that our neighbors can do in this situation that isn't calling cops, that isn't calling someone who's going to come with guns. Additionally, this year was the largest and most community planned trans equity summit. It is a huge win and something to be celebrated, but we can't stop here. We need to use the momentum and put more energy and money into trans equity in Minneapolis. Despite huge successes such as this past year's tra trans equity summit and successful community engagement throughout the city, significant disparities still exist for trans citizens. We are still seeing a rise in violence against trans folks, especially trans women of color. It is crucial for there to be full-time trans equity staff. 
Yesterday, I volunteered at QQuest, a day-long event for LGBTQ youth with workshops, performance, and conversation. The energy was amazing. I overheard youth explaining to other youth what pronouns were, there were a lot of rainbows everywhere, and a general feeling of support. This event seems so necessary and amazing for the young people involved. I would love for there to be more and more spaces like this for trans youth and adults. I believe in a world in this city that is based in community safety programs and violence, violence prevention work and in supporting all members of our city. We cannot achieve this by funding 14 more cops. We need to put our money into supporting our community, into prioritizing youth homelessness instead of criminalizing youth. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Rabbi Zimmerman, welcome. Hi, thank you. And after you. her, we have Leah Soul and Ellie Fireside. Perfect. My name is Rabbi Marcia Zimmerman. I'm the senior rabbi at Temple Israel. I live in the 13th Ward, and I work in the 7th. I'm here with Make Homes Happen and Align Minneapolis, formerly DCEH. I represent 35,000 people who belong to religious institutions and 12 congregations. When we talk about the prophetic tradition, we talk about people who didn't foresee the future, but were morally outraged in the present, because we know what we do today will determine the future. And so from Isaiah, we hear what we should do. We should feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and provide shelter for the homeless. That is the work we must do. That is what Isaiah taught us. That is what is important today. And we have the potential and the possibility of not just placing some money at some time to put our finger in the dike, but rather to systematically make a difference. And so our budget is a moral document. You know that, I know that. It says what we believe in. It reflects truly who we are as a city. And so I am asking for a sustainable source of funding for housing, $50 million. And for me, that would be an incredible moment where we can say, Yes, Isaiah, we have heard your words. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Next we have Leah Soul, Ellie Fireside, and Truck Ann Kiev. Is Leah Soul here? No. Yeah, I took piece. I took Leah's spot. She had to go. Uh, my name is July. I'm coming out of Powderhorn. Um, just rolled up in here, but I come I'm over sorry, here. I, have you signed up to speak? Because we do need to take speakers in the order that they are. Yep, so I got to go to work, and I got number 38, and nobody else is going to do 38. Oh, I so. see. I, I got it. Yep. You have number 38. Yep, I got 38. Thank exactly, you. yes. Well, All right, yep, thank you. All right, so to me it feels obvious, but we'll shout out, like, move money out of the police department. That just, let's do it. Uh, housing, affordable housing, let's do it. And then uh, after that, I'll come in and speak specifically to the um, ask to put at least two full-time um, trans equity staff up in the city in the 2020 budget, uh, having been to the Trans Equity Summit in 2018 and 2019, I can speak personally to the way that the summit was a more powerful experience that honored and centered community in new ways in 2019, which I believe is largely due to the fact that TRAC was on the ground organizing in the community for several months leading up to the summit. And even still, it left ambiguity about the ways that the city is trying to hold a summit for trans people or a summit for cis people who are professionals who work with trans people, which is what the 2018 summit was. So I'm trying to see if we can't have like something else that can be for like cis professionals that work with trans people, because that needs to happen, because they don't know how to work with my community. And I'm trying to see the city build out a more powerful trans equity summit. Uh, two full-time trans staff people will help us to be um, on the ground in the community 
getting the topics and the conversations and the breakout groups that the community will most benefit from, um, in addition to emboldening and empowering the Trans Equity Council, which has existed for years, but had basically no power to actually do anything. Um, I came in here this morning thinking about the two forms of magic as I think about them, the form of magic that shows up and demands something, and the deeper form of magic that can show up when we don't have to demand anymore. And I would say that at this moment, the city, at most, at its best moment, is experiencing the community's magic that pertains to demands. And it's not Thank until you. there is space, invitation, and autonomy for trans people that there will be the deeper magic that actually transforms the world. Thank you. If you could please sign in with the clerk so we make sure that we have your name correct. Next we have speaker number 39, Ellie Fireside, at speaker number 40, Truck Ann Kiev, and speaker number 41, Mary Thomas. Welcome. Hello. Um, I am Ellie Fireside Osterhead, and I live in Whittier. Um, I'm here to speak in support of investing in community over cops and in support of funding two permanent full-time trans equity staff roles. I think Minneapolis has been taking important steps to support community safety and trans equity. That said, in a state with some of the worst racial disparities that we hear about all the time, um, and in a city undergoing rapid gentrification, we need to do so much more. I want Minneapolis to invest in our communities of color instead of criminalizing them. I want us to invest in real safety by funding violence prevention and by enforcing wage theft and protecting workers. Investing in trans equity is also a community safety strategy. Trans people, especially trans people of color, are disproportionately experiencing homelessness and face significant structural violence. Trans equity includes creating more opportunities for accessible, high quality housing, education, employment, and so much more. Please keep this momentum going around trans equity by permanently funding these two full-time trans equity staff roles. Please invest in real safety um, instead of hiring 14 more cops. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Next we have Truck Ann Kiev, and then speaker number 41, Mary Thomas, and speaker number 42, Alyssa Hoven. Hello, city council members. My name is Chupan Q. I go by TA. I grew up in South Minneapolis, and I live in Whittier. I ask that every city council member prioritize in the budget to permanently fund two trans equity staff positions. And instead of hiring 14 more cops, I ask that you invest in the community-based solutions and support the thoughtful solutions put forth from Reclaim the Block. I believe Minneapolis can be an inclusive, safe, and thriving place for all people. I'm an immigrant. My family moved here. I've seen the best sides of humanity here. But currently, it is not for all people. Significant disparities still exist for trans folks in virtually all areas like employment, healthcare, safety, housing, the list goes on. These disparities are compounded when we consider the intersection of race. Cis people and white people navigate through these systems because the system is designed for them to make them feel safe and that they belong. I cannot stand by unless our city leaders ensure the same for our trans youth, our fellow coworkers, our partners, siblings and nibblings, and centering people of color. As mentioned earlier, before from speakers, before me, the Trans um, Gender Equity Council and Reclaim the Bog have put forth innovative, strategic, and responsive solutions to ensure true safety for all of us. As community leaders with power, I urge you to invest in the community-based solutions that will keep trans people safe, keep black, indigenous, and people of color safe. We need safe housing, accessible, affordable mental health care, and fair wages for working families. Please help us all thrive. We need your help to design and budget to adequately support the long-term solutions to shift us there. I'm sorry I'm so emotional, but this is our lives. And um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Trukan. Next we have Mary Thomas, speaker number 41, Alyssa Hoven, followed by Andrew Falstrom. Welcome. Hello, my name is Mary. Um, I grew up in Ward 13, and I currently live in the um, Stephen Square neighborhood. Um, I'm here today to please ask that every council member um, fund vote to support uh, funding for full, two full-time, year-round, permanent trans equity staff roles, starting with the 2020 annual budget. Already, so much tremendous progress has been made that we can be joyful about um, while these positions were funded in 2018 and 2019. 
Um, and I would love to see that momentum maintained. Um, I think that um, that would be the best way to respect all of the work of these staffers and also their community members that they've been working with. Um, I think these full-time positions um, will increase the Transgender Equity Council's ability to follow through on promises made um, and relationships that have been fostered with community members already. Um, in terms of wins, I'm sure you're aware of some of them. The, this year's Trans Equity Summit has already been spoken to is highly successful in many ways. Um, but what really excites me is the progress um, made in 2019 um, to build individual and organizational partnerships within the community, specifically getting tables um, for the Trans Equity Council at Minnesota um, People of Color Pride, um, coalition building with Outfront Minnesota, um, as well as improving the working environment for trans and gender nonconforming city staffers um, through the Trans Issues Working Group and LGBTQ Employee Resource Group. Um, so I'm very excited to see what this um, group can do next. Finally, I think it ties in really well with violence prevention. Um, and as it's in, um, many people have said, encouraging um, trans equity in Minneapolis will really make everyone safer. Um, so this is better than cops. Thank <laughs> Thanks. you for your time. Next, we have Alyssa Hoven, Andrew Falstrom, and then speaker number 46 after that, Alex Gallier. There were a couple people in between that left, so welcome. Hi, uh, I'm not Alyssa, but I have signed in with a clerk and she um, had to leave, so I'll be taking her spot. Um, my name is Trom Huang and I'm a policy advocate for the Alliance. Our organization has been steeped in the many efforts that have been put into addressing our city's affordable housing crisis um, on multiple fronts from funding to policies. And I'm here to communicate what we've heard from our own community and within our own member organizations, which is that the proposed housing investments in the 2020 budget are insufficient to meet community needs. As a member of the Make Homes Happen Coalition, we are asking you to deepen your commitment to equitable housing in 2020 and beyond by working with staff, advocates, staff across departments, cities across the state and state legislators to identify, legalize at the state level and pass one or more local long-term dedicated sources of funding for housing. We remember the commitments that many city council members made during our housing candidate forums in 2017 and will continue to work with you for as long as necessary to turn those commitments into real dollars for housing. For the Alliance, housing investments are not just a matter of creating affordable homes, but an equitable housing system. And for us, that means expanding the conversation beyond the three Ps. Yes, preservation, production, and tenant protections are incredibly important. And I think our analysis needs to include two additional um, Ps, which is the placement of housing to benefit historically discriminated um, and disinvested communities. And second, renter power, ensuring that renters are not just trapped in a cycle of consuming housing, um, but that they're able to participate in the housing system with equal power to achieve goals like community ownership and limited equity cooperatives. Um, for that to become a reality, we will need to see city dollars to support upcoming policies like the tenant opportunity to purchase. Um, we believe the city should also be considering the racial impacts of its investments, particularly related to the cultural districts outlined in the budget. Um, our communities know too well that when new investments enter historically disinvested neighborhoods, the risk of displacement is highly increased. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. I will need you to sign in at the desk so that we have the accurate name um, of you. When speakers need to leave, and I appreciate everybody is coming up on time and need to leave for work, um, we need you to turn your numbers into the clerk and not just hand them off to somebody else. Andrew Falstrom, Alex Gallier, and then Greg Urban. Welcome. So I'm gonna start by paraphrasing a poem by Christy Namey, oops, Erickson. It's called A Love Letter to Alaska. I know the word budget doesn't sound sexy, but it's actually one of the most romantic things a leader does. It's not just about allocating funds, it's about sentiment. Whether you're a city or a nonprofit or a household, a budget is used by those with big desires. It communicates our values, our ideals, our limits. It separates our wants from our needs. Like you, when I read the proposed budget, I don't see numbers, I see people. I see my neighbors, my community. This budget communicates to us in Minneapolis what we want and what we need, and who we want and who we need. When there's enough money to preserve and increase police funding year after year, it says to us, we need them. 
But when it suggests that there's not enough for solving our housing crisis, our youth homelessness, our mental health crisis, the progress in trans equity, or addressing wage theft, it says to our children, our sick, our most exploited workers, and our trans family, we want you, but we don't need you. And I know that that message doesn't reflect us as a people, because in our city, on this land, we know how we belong to each other. The budget offered for feedback today is a statement of our collective values, and today you heard the values that you can incorporate into changing this budget. You heard that in Minneapolis, we don't leave each other out in the cold. We take care of the air that we breathe. We step up in crises and we respond. We resource our community work, we look to root causes, we have abundance. We take care of each other and the earth, and we are serious about solutions. In Minneapolis, we will not poison the streets that we walk on. We will not look into each other's eyes searching for criminals. We will see each other, our people. In Minneapolis, we refuse to solve our most basic, precious, and human needs with more policing and more criminalization. In Minneapolis, we choose each other, and we find true safety. And I submit to the record Bob Kroll, the chosen image and elected leadership of the Minneapolis Police Department. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next we have speaker number 46, Alex Gallier. Speaker number 47, Greg Urban. Speaker number 48, Molly Van Avery. Welcome, Alex. Is Alex in the room? Okay, we're gonna skip. Um, speaker number 47, Greg Urban. And then 48, Molly Van Avery. Good afternoon, my name is Greg Urban. I'm a local business owner. Um, I'm also a city council member in Badness Heights, so I understand the dynamics of what everybody here is working through with their budgets. We're doing the same. Uh, this spring I opened the third location of my chain of nightclubs, Wild Greg's Saloon, on First Avenue here in the Warehouse District. We opened with great success uh, all spring and into summer, bringing great crowds of people, not only from Minneapolis, but from the suburbs to come down and enjoy everything downtown has to offer, and my business included. But every shooting, we had two of which were on my block. The business would go down. Each shooting, each time people would wake up Sunday morning and see the headlines, another shooting in the warehouse district. We'd go down, go down. When the disgusting attack at Target Field made headline news, business fell off a cliff, not just for my business, but for everybody's downtown. The Twins were close to clinching the playoffs at the time. Sold out crowds on Friday night would leave the stadium. 40,000 people would go straight home. Downtown would be dead at midnight. Very unfortunate. And the victims of this is not just the business owners. The employees are true victims of this. Our staffing levels are probably about half of what they were earlier this spring. The employees that remain are getting less hours and substantially less tips. I'm hearing every day that they don't know if they want to drive downtown and pay $20 to park to work down here. So I would ask that you support the mayor's proposal to add police officers to the force and help make downtown a safe and vibrant place for everybody. Thank you. Next we have Molly Van Avery, then followed by Cecil Smith and Jesse Mortensen. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, powerful people. It's good to see you all. <laughs> um, so my name is Molly Van Avery, and I live in the Powderhorn neighborhood. And I wanted to just share that I wake up extremely grateful every day to own my home, thanks to the support, financial support from the City of Lakes Community Land Trust. And I'm here with Make Homes Happen to thank you for your efforts and to advocate for affordable housing throughout Minneapolis, urging you to do everything in your power to create a consistent, dedicated, significant source of funding exclusively for affordable housing. I just wanted to say that because of my stable housing and my low monthly mortgage, I've been able to house artists, a low-income law student dedicated to um, immigration reform, partner with the GLBT host home program to open my house to a young trans person coming out of homelessness. And also because of affordable housing, I was able to go back to school and gratefully become a single queer parent by choice. 
So I wrote a poem for you. I came with a present. <laughs> um, and this poem was a result of conversations that I had with housed Minneapolis folks about what they love most about being home. And I hope that you can hang it somewhere in your office and see it every day and re be reminded of why the work that you do and the advocacy that you do is so vital. So it's called Shelter Us. Very short. Dear Truth, to have a home is to have rest, to put babies to bed, cradle creation, origin, foundation, kiss our loves, shelter our loneliness, hold our stories, tend our altars. Dear Homes, we thank you for the ways you still us, bump music to dance us, close doors to restore us, turn on heat to warm us, simmer rights to feed us. Dear Leaders, keep committing resources so that we can all say I sleep cared for. I wake up safe. I am housed. May people empower in our shared Minneapolis day after day insist upon this. We all have homes that are dear to us. Thank you so much for your work and your time. Thank you. While well, we're not allowed to accept gifts, a poem seems very appropriate. So if you want to give that to the clerk, we'll be sure to get them. We have Cecil Smith, Jesse Mortensen, followed by Jake Vierden. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the Council. My name is Cecil Smith and I reside in the Logan Park neighborhood of Northeast Minneapolis. Uh, I'm here to make remarks on three aspects of the budget, but I only have time for two. The first, property taxes. Your own budget documents indicate that property taxes will rise 13.5% on apartments. In naturally occurring affordable housing, which I own and manage in the city, these increases year after year are a significant burden on the poorest residents of the city. Property taxes are the largest operating expense at NOAA properties by a wide margin. Water and sewer costs are in the next tier of expenses, but those rates set by this council and mayor keep rising faster than inflation year after year. Then this year, the capital off, you raise rental license fees dramatically. The reality is obvious. Broad housing affordability is not a goal of this budget. Property tax hikes on the poorest residents through their rental property managers are the real news. And your own budget document on page 49 makes that clear. This approach is regressive, not progressive. And the responsibility for the displacement of residents is going to rest on this body and our county government and school board. Lastly, I work uh, in the community. I work in a, in a community that experiences significant crime. I had had many occasions over the years to seek the assistance of the third precinct. I call for assistance only when I need to because I know our officers have many pending calls at most times of the day. Earlier this year, we had a carjacking outside our building. The victim managed to detain one of the alleged perpetrators. For the safety of the victim and the perpetrator, we made a citizen's arrest and called 911. We were a priority one call. It became clear after a few minutes that the perpetrator was under the influence of some substance. We called 911 again and pleaded for assistance. The operator told me, I'm sorry, you're a priority one call, but I have no available squads in the city. We endured a verbal assault of demeaning and sex sexually grotesque statements, spitting, threats, and provocation for an hour before a squad arrived. The Thank victim you, was sir. a person of color, and to add to the injury of losing his vehicle, he thought the police did not care. I corrected the assumption. Thank the you, third sir. precinct does not care, but they don't have enough officers to meet the expectations, especially to respond to a priority one call. Thank you, sir. This is a structural problem, Madam Chair. Thank you, I appreciate that. We I urge you to prioritize more officers. Thank you. Jesse Mortensen, followed by speaker number 52. Jake Vierden, followed by speaker number 53. Cecil Deloitte, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Jesse Mortensen. I live uh, a couple blocks from the uh, Midtown Light Rail Station. I'm the CTO of a tech startup with an office downtown. And I'm here to ask you to listen to the voices in the room and elsewhere who are asking you to consider a much broader, more authentic definition of public safety. Um, as I walk through the city, there's a number of forms of privilege that I benefit from. And I know that my experience is not the same as everybody else's experience living in, and working in the city. And I'm not here to speak for people whose experience is different, but I'm here to ask you to listen to those voices. Um, one of the things that's really clear to me hearing those voices is that the conventional definition of public safety that has purported to protect and serve people who benefit from privilege, people who tend to look like me historically, uh, is not just a neutral consideration for the city to balance against other considerations. That definition of public safety actually 
actively causes harm in our city. Um, I think we've heard some of the language that comes from that narrow definition of public safety today in this room. Um, some of the language around the homeless, panhandlers, control and containment, the kind of language that spills effortlessly from this discourse of traditional public safety. Um, in my neighborhood, folks who are experiencing homeless are my neighbors first and foremost. Um, these are folks who are, they are experiencing problems, but they're problems created by the way our communities configured, the way our economies configured. I want to see a definition of public safety that encompasses all of these experiences, and that's why I'm asking you to support an investment in holistic public safety and a divestment from policing and incarceration. Um, and very quickly, I want to speak to downtown because I commute downtown all the time by bike. My safety is at risk downtown on a weekly basis because we have uh, bad biking infrastructure downtown. Worst place in the city for me to be moving around. And five, a handful of transit cops is not going to change that. I'm sorry, but the transportation enforcement approach is not going to work. We need infrastructure for safe biking. Thank you. Thank you. We have speaker number 52, Jake Vierden, followed by speaker number 53, Susan Deloitte, and then speaker number 55, Rue Doug Mitchell. Welcome. Good morning. I wanted to put the mayor's request for 14 more police officers into some context and point to across the street from the downtown library, there is a city-owned parking lot that the Minneapolis Youth Congress used to host their supplies while they were doing their outreach work with young people experiencing homelessness and oppression. The city sold that city-owned lot to a billion-dollar developer who is currently building a 37-story tower which will contain corporate headquarters, a five-star hotel, and 19 high-end luxury private residences, not one unit of affordable housing, nothing for these young people, no jobs for those young people. What this call for 14 more police officers is really about is making this city more comfortable for big real estate. And it's about locking up and further displacing the working class people and the people of color that don't fit into Jacob Fry's vision of a gentrified city. Come on. I live in the Phillips neighborhood, the same neighborhood that Cecil talked about, and it's interesting to hear his story because I watched four squad cars roll into the parking lot of my place of employment with tasers pulled and guns drawn on Somali young people who are terrified and traumatized, and nobody in my neighborhood is safer from that interaction. I live in the Phillips neighborhood. I have never once been made to feel unsafe by the poor people who live in my neighborhood, by my neighbors. The only time I feel unsafe, even with all of my privilege, is when armed police officers roll up. I'm thinking about Jamar Clark in November, and every time I hear sirens, my heart rate increases and I feel a pit in my stomach. I also just wanted to say I've seen some council members eager to take photos when Trump was here with signs that said unbreakable solidarity. And I just want to um, encourage y'all to consider the fact that solidarity is not measured at photo shoots and rallies. That's easy. Solidarity is measured on how you vote on this budget. And 14 more police officers has nothing to do with solidarity for oppressed people. Thank you. Next we have speaker number 53 signed in. It looks like. Susan Deloitte, but it didn't come all the way through. Welcome, you'll correct me, please. Yes, good morning. Uh, my name is Susan Delatra, born and raised in Minneapolis and living right now out on 35th Avenue and 50th Street. I'm here today in support of Nokomis Healthy Seniors and to tell you what a difference they have made in my life in three ways that I want you to hear about. First of all, transportation. I don't have a car, so I call the office and I get a ride from a volunteer. They have a wonderful volunteer team of drivers and one of them will take me to my doctor or my dentist and that keeps me as healthy as I can be. And talking about health, how about exercise? They have a wonderful exercise program. I get to go and do senior exercise, which is perfect for me. And then I can take yoga. And she's a beautiful teacher. So I get the benefit of all that. But here's something just as important, and that's community. I live alone. So when I go over to the Healthy Seniors, I have friends. These are people I get to see when I go there. This makes a tremendous difference in my life. So thank you. Thank you for sh your support in funding these organizations, Nokomis Healthy Seniors and the others. Please continue to fund us and help us grow and help us stay healthy. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Delatra. Next, we have Rudug Mitchell, Greta Getz, and Randy Gray. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Doug Mitchell. I live in 17th Avenue South in the 11th Ward. I'm a retired associate pastor from Westminster Presbyterian Church, and I represent Align Minneapolis, formerly DCEH, on the Make Homes Happen Coalition. People of faith care a great deal about members of our community who are at the margins, those that Jesus described as the least of these. We Christians, Jews, and Muslims are people who are guided by sacred texts. Our current situation as a society with deep divisions, massive inequality in wealth, power, education, and opportunity, we are spoken to by an ancient prophet, Jeremiah, who speaks the word of the Lord to the Hebrews who have been taken into exile in Babylon. God says, what God wants from faithful people is to seek the welfare, the wholeness of the whole community, because in that community we find our welfare, and only in that community. Unless the entire community exper experiences wholeness, then those who are a part of it, no matter what their privilege, are not whole. So we cannot seek our own separate welfare one group cannot maintain its own position at the expense of others. Those who are housed cannot maintain their status at the expense of those who are not housed. Among the other activities that Align Minneapolis does is they run an emergency rental assistance program, and so we work daily with those who are experiencing the housing crisis. Make Homes Happen is appreciative of the increase in budgets for affordable housing in the last two years, but we are very disappointed in the continued lack of commitment to fund a long-term dedicated strategy for funding affordable housing. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Mitchell. Sorry, I mispronounced your name here. We are dealing with curbing copies. We have Greta Getz, Randy Gray, and then Patrick Conley. Welcome, Greta. Thank you. My name is Greta Gates, and I live at 608 West 25th Street in the Whittier neighborhood. Um, and I'm here today speaking on behalf of Twin Cities Habitat for Humanity and as part of the Make Homes Happen Coalition. Housing impacts every doctor's office, classroom, and boardroom in our community. And it is a building block of economic vitality for Minneapolis. At Habitat for Humanity, families tell us that the homes they own improve every area of their lives. Families are healthier, kids do better in school, and parents can build wealth so that the next generation can be even stronger. In the face of an affordable housing crisis, now is the time to be bold. Right now, nonprofits like Twin Cities Habitat are being bold. We've doubled the number of home buyers we can serve in the last few years thanks to thousands of generous donors, volunteers, and corporate faith and government partners. Businesses are also being bold. Local companies like Bremer Bank and U.S. Bank are stepping up to help us create and preserve more affordable homeownership opportunities in our community. Now is the time for the city of Minneapolis to be bold too. Cities across the country are facing housing challenges, and now is our chance to set Minneapolis apart. We need local, dedicated investments in affordable housing that reflect the demonstrated needs of our city. And we need a long-term commitment to expanding safe, stable, and affordable homeownership opportunities that build a stronger city for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you. We have Randy Gray, followed by Patrick Conley, followed by speaker number 59, Natalie Jacobson. Do we have speakers 57, 58, or 59? And oh. Thank you. I'm sorry, it takes me a little bit to get places. I apologize. I apologize. Not a Welcome, problem. Randy. Thank you. Um, my name is Randy Gray. I live in Northeast Minneapolis. I have lived there for six years by way of Chicago, Illinois. Um, I'm calling for the fact that we do need more protection, but at the same time, we definitely need better training for our police officers. Um, as someone who is effectively part of the statistic of Chicago, of Chicago violence, being the fact that my father was murdered and I identified his body and myself. Um, it's one of those things that when I see the change of what Minneapolis is becoming, is one of the reasons why I left Chicago. Um, and that starts with the fact that gentrification pushes people out, but also the lack of training doesn't help the fact that we can just hire people for new jobs without giving them proper training. While volume does help, 
uh, training does help even way beyond then the volume of what someone can and can't do. My mother was a police officer, so I do understand what that how hard that job can be on a person. But as a black youth, as someone who literally had to identify his his father with being murdered and being the oldest of ten and not having them even understand until they become older, it would be a very traumatic situation for the violence to increase in Minneapolis overall. Also, I am a food and beverage manager at the Hilton Minneapolis, so I would directly see a lot of the, the changes of downtown, homeless people um, coming in and you know, stopping pedestrians, the fact that we have no warm place for these people to sleep at night, it's already got down to nine degrees at night, and I have to go to work and see people suffering and, and be cold, and, and it's one of the reasons why I left Chicago, but it's because I don't have enough to do. I didn't have, I didn't have a voice. I feel in this city I do, and I just don't want to see anyone suffer the way that me or my family has in Chicago. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have speaker number 58, Patrick Conley, speaker 59, Natalie Jacobson, and speaker 60, Catherine Schaefer. Welcome. Hello. My name is Patrick Connolly. I am a proud resident of the 8th Ward. I'm here to speak today about community safety and empowerment from two different angles. First, asking for the funding of two full-time year-round permanent trans equity staff roles in this 2020 budget. And secondly, funding for programs that address the root causes of violence in this city. Minneapolis needs to build a community that feels safe for everyone, no matter race, gender, ability, or other identity group. Building a community that feels safe, there is power in feeling safe, and for many communities, safety does not come from additional police officers, as is currently proposed in the 2020 budget. Safety and empowerment for communities who are the most policed comes from a feeling that people who have knowledge of and care for communities will be responding to emergency calls and doing the community work to prevent such emergencies from happening in the first place. Paid staff positions working for trans equity would promote community safety and empowerment as shown by recent successes spearheaded by Track Trachtenberg, the current trans equity projects coordinator, and the Trans Equity Council. These include the largest ever trans equity summit and new and strengthened partnerships that promote this work and community building. A second ask I have is for an increased funding for programs that address the root causes of violence in Minneapolis. A year ago this week, a man was killed by Minneapolis police officers who were responding to a call of a suicidal individual. As someone living with chronic mental illness who occasionally does experience these acute crises, I do not personally feel safe with police officers responding when I need that emergency help. That is why I am joining my voice with Reclaim the Block to demand that instead of throwing cops at our communities and making us feel more unsafe, invest in solutions such as increased funding for mental health response teams and increased competency training to in, be included in the budget. Thank you. Next we have Natalie Jacobson, Catherine Schaefer, and then speaker number 61, Tawan Nin. Welcome. Hi, my name is Natalie Jacobson. I live in Ward 10, and I have two asks for the City Council today. Uh, my first ask is that the City Council fund two full-time year-round permanent trans equity staff roles, starting with the 2020 annual budget. I'm here today because the Trans Equity Council is doing incredible work and they need institutionalized support from the city in order to do this work. Every member of city council should care about this because we know that transgender individuals face disparities in access to health care, safety, housing, and a variety of other areas both in our city and across the nation. Violence against trans people, particularly trans women of color, is rising. If the City Council truly cares about the safety and well-being of all of its residents, every member of Council needs to fight to prioritize the Minneapolis trans community. And my second ask today is that the City invest in community-based safety solutions that get at the root causes of violence in our city, the ones proposed by Reclaim the Block. Instead of hiring 14 more cops, Minneapolis should fund the Office of Violence Prevention, invest in youth homelessness services, fund solutions to the opioid crisis, and enforce wage theft laws. Thank you so much in advance for investing in our community and the solutions that truly keep all of us safe and thriving. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Speaker number 60, Catherine Schaefer. 
Welcome, followed by Tawan Nunn, speaker number 61, and then Wallace White, number 62. Welcome. Hi, my name is Katherine Schaefer, and I live in Ward 3, and I'm here to ask for two full-time, fully funded positions for the Trans Equity Council. Minneapolis has a really vibrant queer community, and it has been attending to the needs of the queer and trans community since 1975. We've been on the forefront of this kind of work, and we need to keep it up. And the current Trans Equity Council has been doing amazing work. The summit was the biggest of its kind. And we need to keep that momentum going. In order to do that, we need some leadership, some fully funded leadership. We have a growing community, too. A recent study that was done by a researcher who's a trans person of color here in Minnesota found that 3% of our youth identify as a gender different from the gender that they were assigned at birth. This is a community that's getting larger and needs our support and needs to feel safe. I also support the asks of Reclaim the Block. Thank you very much. Thank you. Speaker number 61, Tawan Nunn, followed by 62, Wallace White, and 63, Elise Ruiz. Welcome. Welcome. How are you doing? My name is Tawan Nunn, and um, I represent the ninth board, and I'm here to represent um, Minneapolis Mad Dash today. And um, we're not here to uh, talk against the uh, police department or none of that. We're just here to... Um, talk that we ask that you guys add us into the budget because we're out there almost seven days a week, you know, doing almost the same type of work they do with like no health benefits or none of that. We're in the community uh, all day uh, diffusing fights, trying to bridge the gap between uh, our community and the police department. And um, yeah, with that being said, thank you. Thank you. Speaker number 62, Wallace White, followed by Elise Ruiz, followed by Speaker 64, Jean Torma. Welcome. Hi, um, my name is Wallace White. I'm with the Minneapolis Man Dads. Um, we're, um, we're not against law enforcement. We're, um, we just uh, want somebody to invest in what's been working already. You know, as the man says, we, um, we're in the downtown area. Uh, Diffusing a lot of the stuff that goes on. We work hand in hand with the police every day, you know. Um, and um, it's hard to work full time on a part time budget, you know. Uh, I mean, uh, a lot of the situations and the things that are going down and we diffuse, um, not only in the downtown area, but in some of the, the rougher areas, uh, Broadway, Lindale. Um, uh, a lot of the other areas that's real infested with a lot of stuff, you know, we, uh, our presence is, uh, is realized there, you know, they, they notice we're there and they're, they're gone, you know, so, I mean, we're just there to ask them for some funding, you know, we need some budgets, you know, and, uh, to keep this work going, you know, uh, 14 police officers, uh, I mean, it's like we're doing the work of 14 police officers, you know, uh, I mean, it's, but it's up to y'all, you know, it's already here, you know, you don't need to, you don't need to hire 14 more, you know, I mean, uh, we're here already, you know. Thank you. Speaker number 63, Elise Freeze. Speaker 64, Jean Torma. Speaker number 65, Elizabeth Bryant. Welcome. Good morning, Chair Palmazano, Council Members. My name is Elise Ruiz, and I am an Associate State Director with AARP Minnesota. So we are the nation's largest nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering Americans 50 and older to choose how to live as they age. So we have more than 660,000 members across the state of Minnesota. We have over 30,000 members here in the city of Minneapolis. And we work to strengthen communities and advocate for what matters most to families with a focus on health security, financial stability, and personal fulfillment. In 2015, Minneapolis became the first city in Minnesota to join the AARP and World Health Organization Network of Age-Friendly States and Communities. This program helps communities address the process of optimizing opportunities for health, participation, and security in order to enhance quality of life as people age. Minneapolis has made many commendable strides towards becoming a more livable community for people of all ages since its 2015 designation. From the subsequent adoption of of Minneapolis for a Lifetime Age-Friendly Action Plan um, to 
reinstatement of funds and programs and services following the official designation to the creation of the missing middle housing pilot program uh, to the Vision Zero Advisory Committee that we are proud to be a member of um, to recent partnerships with our office working on events for healthy aging in community. Um, so we're proud of the work that uh, the city has done to date during this four year five year, or four phase five year process of continual improvement required by the age friendly program. So the continuation of the age-friendly work is um, critical and will play a large role in the city's future. Looking at aging demographics, Minneapolis saw a 9% increase in its 50-plus population between 2010 and 2015, and over a quarter of its residents are already 50 years of age and older. So we know that people are living Thank longer, you. want to stay in their communities. Um, we've actively been working with Councilmember Schrader to Thank proactively you, sustain um, the funding that we've had and are looking to to see a little bit more in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Speaker 64, Jean Torma. Speaker 65, Elizabeth Bryant. And 66 is Kat Hammond. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Council. Um, I live in, my name is Jean Torma. I live in near North, close to North Commons and North High. I've lived there for more than 30 years. I'm here to support the Chief's and the Mayor's ask for more police officers. I don't believe more police officers needs to be a negative thing. I believe that if they're hired properly, trained properly, supported properly, and held accountable, they can be a positive thing for our community and work with the other holistic solutions that have been presented here today. I'm in particular support of a tra uh, uh, traffic enforcement. I think it's ludicrous that a city of this size has no traffic enforcement. Um, my neighborhood has consistently, and I on a daily basis see in particular three things, no stops. Stop signs might as well say slow roll. That's what people do constantly. Um, whenever I'm at an intersection, walking my dog, walking myself, I stop and make sure even if a car is a block down, whether or not they're gonna stop, because they often don't. Um, I, um, there are hit and runs. My neighbor's cars have been damaged by being parked on the streets. Um, one neighbor in particular has had several cars damaged over the last few years. I um, witnessed myself a T-bone at 8 in the morning in the intersection near my house. Um, a woman and her three kids were going, had the right of way going east and west, car blew through the stop sign north and south and T-boned her. Luckily, there were neighbors there to help and no one got injured. Um, I do believe that uh, reducing the speed limit from 30 to 20 is not going to do a thing. If people don't go 30, they're sure not going to go 20. Very, very seldom do I see people uh, going the speed limit. And I think the majority of people in my neighborhood um, agree with me. So I don't feel that um, it should be an either or, fund cops or fund other solutions. I think that everybody can work together and that cops should be part of the community rather than apart from. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker number 65, Elizabeth Bryant, 66, Kat Hammond, and 67, Madeline Dillon McWilliams. Welcome. Hi. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Elizabeth Louise Reek Bryant. I live at 2716 Hennepin Avenue. That is Ward 7. I'm here because I believe in my neighbors. I believe in each of you on the council and every single person in this room and throughout the city of Minneapolis to make our communities more collaborative and safe. To me, a more collaborative and safe community looks like a community where we know our neighbors. It looks like a community where we have skin in the game in our collective struggles because we have been conditioned to replace our unknowing with fear. And when we respond out of a place of fear, we risk the safety of ourselves and of our neighbors. There have been a number of people who have have um, given concrete solutions in this regard that do not necessitate greater funding for the Minneapolis Police Department, and I stand in solidarity, solidarity with these solutions. I stand in solidarity with the Trans Equity Council. I stand in solidarity with Black Visions Collective and Reclaim the Block. I want Minneapolis to invest in community safety by investing specifically in our youth, particularly in youth homelessness services, in young people of color, and in LGBTQ youth, who have always been the genesis of an American culture that is vibrant, beautiful, and global. Instead of hiring 14 more cops, I urge you to invest in young people. They are our future, and they are our neighbors, and they are us. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have speaker number 66, Kat Hammond, 67. 
Madeline McWilliams, 68 Warren Christie. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Kat Hammond. I live at 16 West 26th Street, and I want to say thank you to the Council for the work that you've done to date um, around trans equity. It is uh, so, so cool and groundbreaking that we have the Trans Equity Summit event and have for six years now that it's an annual event. It is so meaningful to have that. Thank you. Um, I'm here to ask for two full-time staff positions dedicated to trans equity on an ongoing basis, starting in the 2020 budget. Um, and I think that I see that as really related to public safety as well. I deeply respect those who have raised concerns about uh, public safety and crime. I'm concerned about safety too, uh, but it's not safety unless it is safety for all of us, including the communities that are ongoing targets of violence from police. I believe that more police and more funding for police is thinking small and reactive to a problem. It's attempting to treat the symptoms of some deep but addressable problems in our community. If I go to the doctor and I say that my nose is running, I do not want the doctor to tell me, oh, did you try duct taping your nose shut? Why don't you try that? Also, the duct tape will occasionally shoot some people. That's not acceptable to me. I want my doctor to treat the source of the problem and prescribe me some medicine. Meaningful support of the most valuable members of our community, meaningful holistic support of the most vulnerable members of our community is how we treat the source of the problem when it comes to crime and safety. Trans equity work and other support of those who face enormous barriers to employment, housing, and education is crime prevention work. It is violence prevention work. It is public safety work. So I'm asking you to please send this budget back to the mayor and ask him to invest in holistic violence prevention, including ongoing support of the trans community here in Minneapolis. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker number 67, Madeline McWilliams, 68, Warren Christie, 69, Jeff Washburn. Hello, my name is Madeline McWilliams. I go by Dylan. Um, my pronouns are they, them, theirs, and I live at 2726 Gerard Ave South in Ward 10. Um, I came here today to support my community and make two asks of the Council. Um, first, I want to thank the Council and in particular um, VP Jenkins and Councilmember Cunningham um, for the work that you've all done towards trans equity. Um, so my first ask is for every Council person to support funding for the two full-time year-round permanent trans equity staff roles starting with the 2020 annual budget. And my second ask is, instead of putting funding towards hiring 14 more cops, as requested by Mayor Fry, I ask the Council to invest in real community safety, including youth homelessness services, non-police mental health response teams for folks in crisis, and other safety solutions suggested by Reclaim the Block. When my trans and gender nonconforming friends and I are turned down for jobs or to rent apartments, which has happened recently, um, there is always a looming question of whether it was just because we're trans. Um, and there's, it feels like there's no real way to, to address that. Um, even more extreme interpersonal and structural violence is faced daily by my trans siblings, elders, and friends, especially black, indigenous, POC, trans women. We need to make the trans community a priority. Um, trans equity initiatives are deeply connected with, um, with solutions to community safety that do not involve police. And I want to also give a shout out to MBD 150. When I um, read their 150 year performance review of the Minneapolis Police Department called Enough is Enough, available for free online, it really gave me an incredible history of MPD. And um, I think it's, it's worth noting too that uh, as a speaker much earlier said, um, policing is deeply connected with slave catching and the history of slavery in this country and white supremacy. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. S speaker number 68, Warren Christie, 69, Jeff Washburn. And then we skip to 71, Ahmed Youssef. Welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I appreciate your, your hard work. I've lived here in Minneapolis all of my 73 years, except for the time in the service of my country. Uh, I've been in my current residents in South Minneapolis near Longfellow Park for over 40 years. We have a good city, a good neighborhood overall. We need to keep it that way. I'm here because some of my neighbors can't be here. Hopefully they can make one of the other sessions. They had to be at work today. I'm fortunate to be retired. <laughs> I am here because I hear people talking about the break-ins of cars, houses, garages, etc. 
I've had one neighbor that has already left. I've had a couple others that are talking about it. I don't want to see people leaving the city. I want to see it become a better city all the way through. I am here in support of the police chief, the chief who has also lived here and knows the city, and I think he knows what needs to be done. I hope you will support him. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker number 71, Ahmed Youssef, 72, Angela Tona, and then we skip to 74, Brian Rosas. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Palmasano, fellow council members, um, for the opportunity to speak to the 2020 Minneapolis proposed budget. My name is Jeff Washburn, sir, as the director of the City of Lakes Community Land Trust. I live in Ward 9, and uh, our organization is also a member of the Make Homes Happen Coalition. Over the years, through over $7 million in city investments, we've been able to create and preserve over 365 permanently affordable home ownership opportunities in 12 of the 13 Minneapolis wards. Uh, this figure includes uh, over 80 resales. That's 80 resales where we've been able to keep each home affordable for another lower moderate income household without having to seek additional funds to make them affordable. We've not lost a single one of those homes uh, to, to the market. Of the households we've been able to serve, uh, we've been able to serve households of color at a rate at about three times that of the rate here in the city of Minneapolis. We all give a lot of talk to affordable housing and racial equity here in the city. The reality is, is we're not doing enough to be able to, to support that talk, especially in affordable home ownership. There's a significant displacement occurring in the city and there are winners and losers uh, as it occurs. Lower income households, uh, who, who we all know are disproportionately community of color households are, are the losers as this plays out. Lowering, um, Inclusionary policies and preferences for long-term affordability are steps in the right direction, but that will only dampen the loss of affordable housing that is already happening at an increasing rate. The only way to make a significant difference uh, is to develop and continue to invest um, dedicated sources of funding here in the city of Minneapolis uh, to, to help bridge that, that difference. These investments, uh, as, as we've learned, would, would only be leveraged many times over uh, with other levels of funding that, that we can bring to the table. Thank you for your continued support of affordable housing but encourage all of you and, and, and all of us to do more this year and future years. Thanks. Thank you. We have Speaker 71, Ahmed Youssef, 72, Angela Tona, and 74, Brian Rosas. Are any of these speakers here? Are any of these, welcome. Hello. Uh, my name is Angela Tona, and I live on uh, 17th Avenue South in the Powderhorn neighborhood. I'm also a master of public policy and a master of social work candidate at the U. And as someone whose life revolves around um, the most up-to-date research around these subjects, I can attest that investing in our community and not cops creates the safe and healthy communities that we dream about. Um, I'm hearing a lot today about how serious the problems of poverty and homelessness are, especially with our young neighbors. And before going back to school, I worked in person-centered, permanent supportive housing for years. And I've watched hundreds of folks sustain healthy lives with simple support of consistent and secure housing. And while there's plenty of folks today who have shared personally why this might be the case, I'll speak a little bit like a Humphrey student for a moment. Um, there's buckets of research that prove that when people feel secure in their needs, crime rates go down, economic consumption rates go up, and communities thrive, etc. cetera. Um, aside from the lifelong trauma that homelessness instills in an individual, it also costs three times as much of taxpayers' money to keep an individual homeless than it does to support them with housing. And we're, and we're spending so much to subsidize emergency health services, temporary shelters, jail stays, and abundant police presence, and we don't have to. The budget, the budget that we have right now sustains the problem that we're trying so hard to eradicate. Um, I heard someone here today say that cops are not social workers, and they're right. Uh, we can invest in the community programs that are represented here today so that the people that truly know what they're doing can build the strong communities that we dream of. And then we won't have to waste money in services that dehumanize ourselves and our neighbors, only to treat the symptoms of poverty rather than the problem. 
So today I ask you to invest in solutions brought forward by Reclaim the Block, which are Youth Homelessness Services, Office of Violence Prevention, solutions um, to the opioid crisis from a harm reduction model, mental health crisis response team, and wage theft that, uh, that protect workers and divest, and divest and not criminalize our neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. We have Speaker 74, Brian Rosas, 75, Valentina McKenzie, 76, Eric Forsby. Welcome. Hi, everyone. My name is Brian Rosas. He, they pronouns, please. Um, I am here as a born and raised person in Minneapolis. Um, so something I've seen a lot here is uh, talk about vibrancy and safety and uh, how much the city has changed. And yes, it has changed. You know, rich developers have come here. Um, we are a victims of capitalism. We are victims of corruption and white supremacy. Um, we have seen time and time again us be victims, people of color, queer people of color, black folk. They are constant victims of all of this. Um, so it is really disappointing um, because my city's always been vibrant. My city has always been full of culture. It's been full of great things until rich developers started to come here, displace us, and then we are the ones criminalized. We are the ones seen as the issue. We are the ones seen as um, the creators of violence and crime when it's just been the effects of everything that's been happening. Um, so it's been really disappointing to hear so many old time residents saying that. Um, I am not for funding of the police. I am a part of so many other queer folks who want to see uh, liberation, who want to see equity, who want to see resources be given to our communities. And the police are not involved with that. We, as the queer liberation movement moves on, we do not want more police. Um, we have seen them also be such an oppressor to us as a queer community. Um, so why further fund them? Um, I don't support the agenda that the police wants to further push, which is marginalized people, oppressed people, further displaced people. It is run by white supremacy and corruption. Why further push them into our city, a city full of diversity, a city full of such great culture? Um, so please consider that. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you. Speaker number 75, Valentina McKenzie, 76, Eric Forsby, and 77, Brian McKenzie. Welcome. Hi, thank you for uh, allowing us to come and share our thoughts um, and feelings with you guys as we get ready to talk about this budget. My name is Valentina McKenzie, and I'm here to ask you that when you say law enforcement, what laws are you actually enforcing? The city of Minneapolis in the past few years has passed several worker right laws and ordinances that are not being enforced or respected. Most, po most people don't even know about their rights until an organizer, an education, outreach worker comes to them and tells them. This isn't about Arredondo. This is about what actually keeps our community safe. What that is, is affordable housing, education opportunities, jobs with steady income, and mental health and addiction resources. I can tell you that when an officer comes into my presence, I don't feel safe. I actually fear for my life. If I need help, I call my brothers, my sisters, my friends, family, community to come to the rescue, never a police officer. Stop investing in the criminalization of black and brown bodies so that you can profit from it. We have city cops, metro cops, traffic cops, SROs, park police, more and more and more and more cops. We don't need any more police. What we need is 300,000 for community contracts and at least one additional investigator for labor standard laws. I stand with the demands of Reclaim the Block, Black Visions Collective, and Seitul and ask that you make the necessary changes to this budget. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker number 76, Eric Forsby, 77, Brian McKenzie, 78, George Mouse. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Eric Forsberg. I'm a resident and business owner in downtown Minneapolis. Um, I am here in support of, um, of Chief Arandondo's request for 14 more um, officers downtown. Uh, I am experiencing an increased level of violence in downtown and, and a lack of safety for both my workers as well as my uh, um, the people that I live with. Um, I, I, I hear what a lot of people are saying and I, and I agree. I, I think the answer is yes to all of this. Um, our community is growing and is changing. Uh, as our community grows and changes, we have to bring proportionate uh, basic safety needs up with it. However, the holistic approaches also need to be in place. We do need to address everything that everybody is talking about in here. There is no simple solution here. However, there has been an erosion of trust. The erosion of trust in our community leaders 
as well as in our police force. Our police force are here to actually protect us, and they are part of the community. They need to be embedded in the community, and that's what Police Chief Arndondo is saying he wants to do. He wants to retrain and change the system. He wants to change the paradigm. This is about bringing in officers that are a part of the Minneapolis community, not, this, not, not the communities that's the rest of this country. Minneapolis has always said no to the rest of the country and said we can do it different. We can build it better. We can show the rest of the country how to do it. And I believe in our chief, and I believe in our sheriff, and they've asked for it, and I'm here to support them. Thank you. Thank you, Eric Forsberg. Sorry, I had your name wrong. Speaker 77, Brian McKenzie. 78, George Mouse. Are either of these speakers here? Doesn't look like it. Speaker number 79, Mike Johnson. Welcome. Followed, it will, he'll be followed by speaker number 82, Kat Salinak, and 83, Jelani Hussein. Hi, my name is Mike Johnson, and uh, I'll go with it. I'll say, now one more cop for this city. Don't give one, in fact, cut the cops. Um, I hear we can't uh, criminalize teens. Um, yeah, we can if they're invading people's homes, if they're shooting people, if they're robbing people. What kind of joke is this? You don't run cities like this. So um, the one thing I've learned is uh, cities all across this nation that are burning down right now, they, they say the same thing. Every mayor says the same thing. Every police chief says the same thing. We can't arrest our way out of this. That's how you know your city's going to burn down. Um, so, so you can make up all the excuses for this crime. You can make up uh, whatever you want to do, cut the police, give them police, whatever. Even if you give them the police, what's that going to do? You, you cut them off at the knees every chance you get. You decriminalize crime. How's that working out? We, in, the, in the midst of our worst drug crisis, we can now deal drugs. Lovely. That's just freaking lovely. Um, so no more cops for this city. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker number 82, Kat Salonek. Is Kat in the room? Welcome. Um, hello, and thank you for hearing from me, uh, Chairwoman and Minneapolis City Council. I am a South Minneapolis resident. Um, I've been in Minneapolis by birth and by choice across many different wards. And I serve at Outfront Minnesota, a South Minneapolis-based nonprofit that's been in the same Sabathany Community Center for about 30 years. And over those 30 years, Outfront has done so much work to support Minneapolis residents. And today I want to talk about a couple uh, current events that are impacting our city, specifically that will impact the Trans Equity Council moving forward. Our president has said that they will no longer fund the Violence Against Women Act that supports Outfront's anti-violence program. They will also not fund um, or encourage health insurance companies to cover trans access to health care. And so what this means, this is a signal that hate crimes against trans people can continue. And unfortunately, we see survivors of hate crimes in Minneapolis every single week in our offices. We have your back when it comes to supporting survivors. We need you to continue to have our back. The police are not cutting it when it comes to working with these survivors. In Councilmember Reich's district just a couple weeks ago, a trans woman was attacked outside of a target in the um, quarry. And we had to see that person. The police walked away from her. They said, no, we will not support you in this. And she had just gotten out of rehab a month before. This woman has been sober for about six months now. She's getting on her feet. She's getting a job. And then her car was destroyed by this perpetrator of violence. The police said, too bad, contact your insurance company. We are now following up with her to make sure that she gets the support she needs to become a great member of this community and to continue on her path to recovery. But we can't have your back unless you have ours. We need at least two full-time people funded. I can say that for myself. I went to the same hospital I was born at, North Minneapolis. Thank you, Kat. Uh, Last comment on this. I was discriminated against at that hospital because of my gender presentation and because of being there with my girlfriend. We need the Trans Equity Council to continue training healthcare providers and the police. Thank you. Next we have Jelani Hussein, followed by Dave Bicking, and then Tony Williams. 
That would be speakers right. number 83, 84, and 85. Welcome, Mr. Hussein. My name is Jelani Hussein. I'm the Executive Director of the Council of American Islamic Relations. Um, and uh, bear with me, I'm going to um, bring into this room today and this conversation what disparities actually mean. So I'm going to speak from here because the communities that I represent, the communities that I work with every single day, experience disparities and the achievement gaps that they deal with from housing, from economic development. The East African community that I see as clients every single day have the lowest home ownership in the city. They have the highest, uh, or the they're also suffering of close to 75% are in poverty. But this community is ex extremely resilient. They're starting businesses on shoestring budgets. And this city is a great city. And in fact, this council is a, a very good council and we are very inspired by the people who elected you to be in this seat. The question today is, is this budget going to reflect addressing the disparities and the challenges that community members who are not able to be here today, who are not afforded to come to this space because of the disparities, will this budget reflect that? And when we talk about crime in the city and when we talk about crime in general, crime manifests from systems of oppression that are based on systems and legacies that create disparities in our city. So I believe that all of you sitting here today will make the right decision and support communities that are in need of support. And I present to the, to the council that you hire and you create community navigators, individuals who work in the most concentrated areas, including Cedar Riverside, in Little Earth, in North Minneapolis, who are not in the towers, who are actually in the community who are helping connect the resources of this wonderful city to the people who need it the most. That is how you address the disparities. And Thank I guarantee you. once you do that, you will see the issues that we are dealing with, the communities taking their role in addressing the issues that we're talking about, including state. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hussein. Speaker number 84 is David Bicking, 85, Tony Williams, 86 is Jamez Staples. Welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Dave Bicking. I live in Ward 8. Um, I entirely support the uh, document that you've already received from Communities United Against Police Brutality. Uh, we have a number of ideas regarding the city's budget. Um, what we need basically, uh, what we're saying in this, is that we need better policing, not just more policing. Um, there's a lot more we could say, and we do, but we tried to take a deeper dive into the budget. And what I discovered, at least, is that that document is not actually a budget. It's not what you would expect from a 600-page document. Um, it's really just a bunch of changes and amendments to the budget with only the most um, great, <laughs> hardly any breakdown in the actual existing budget. And that is what also needs to be looked at. Um, for instance, in the police budget, it's broken down into four or five categories, patrol, administration, professional standards, investigation, I think there's another one, but that's it. How can we possibly understand a police budget that isn't broken down more than that? Um, the process itself of having just the changes being presented pretty much guarantees annual increases in the budget above inflation because we're not looking at anything except additions. As far as the base budget, um, well, I'd say this could be okay, this breakdown, if there were an existing budget to look at that had more detail. But I've looked at the 2018 and 2019 actual budgets. I've looked at the consolidated annual financial report. There's more, no more detail there. The point is that this is simply not enough for the public to make an informed, uh, helpful input into the budgeting process in the police department or anywhere else. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 85, Tony Williams, 86, Jamez Staples, 87, Marina Kitaka. 
Uh, hello, Chair Palmasano, Council. Um, my name is Tony Williams. I live at 2443 Garfield Avenue South. Um, so this isn't going to come as a surprise, but I'm here to advocate for no new police in the 2020 budget. Um, so over the past couple months, I've had the pleasure of serving as a City Council appointee on the 911 MPD work group. Um, so thank you for that honor. It's been really interesting um, to get to learn more about the infrastructure um, that makes our city respond to emergencies. Um, so going into that, I thought I might change my perspective, honestly. I was like, oh, maybe if I get a look at some of the way that our emergency response infrastructure works, um, I'll soften my views a little bit and think that we should have a lot of different approaches, maybe including police. Not true. Um, I think that um, our emergency response infrastructure is actually really evident the way we look at it now of a system that looks at crisis and refuses to look at the contributing factors that move into it, right? So when we look at stuff like emergency, uh, like um, emotionally disturbed person calls, wow, that I have to say that. It doesn't feel good to say that. Um, when we look at our mental health crisis response calls, right, we see that it's just police who respond to them um, and that they're all categorized as priority one calls, which sort of implies that there's an inherent danger there. So when I think about the killings of Travis Jordan and other folks who have experienced mental health crises, it sort of makes sense to me given the way that we even categorize. So I'm thinking about the way that these systems result in outcomes for our most vulnerable residents, and it's not looking good. Um, and then I think about like overdoses, right? And I found out that it's a standard practice of the Minneapolis Police Department to handcuff people who have overdosed before they wake them up, right? And does, is that really what care for our community looks like in the middle of a huge opioid crisis? Um, I certainly don't think so. So when I'm thinking about ways that we can make these systems better, we do have some recommendations that we're going to be presenting to you next week as a work group. I wholeheartedly support some of those recommendations, especially the ones around alternative response to mental health crisis. But I also want to say we need funding for the Office of Violence Prevention. We need investments in youth homelessness services. We need to fund solutions to the opioid crisis that aren't about arresting people um, who have overdosed. We need to send mental health responders to um, you, mental Mr. health Williams. calls. Yep, we need to enforce wage theft laws. Um, and we need two trans equity liaisons. Come on, let's, Thank, let's protect the most vulnerable people Williams. in our community. Thank Next you. This is Jamez Staples, welcome. Followed by Marina, M Marina Kataka, and speaker number 88 is the last one I have signed in, and that is Tamara Russell. Good morning, I'm sorry. Good morning, Council. Uh, my name is Jamez Staples. I'm a resident of North Minneapolis. And uh, I woke up this morning to the news that Minneapolis and, and uh, St. Paul, the Twin Cities, are the worst place for uh, black Americans. And that's a 24-7 Wall Street um, report that was on CBS. Issues like this seriously concern me, especially when we have unique opportunities leveraging the things that uh, policies that are actually in place with the city of Minneapolis, uh, actually the Met Council and even the county, the state, and even the, the local utility are pushing for uh, green energy opportunities. Uh, I'm sorry, green energy infrastructure. Um, I've acquired a piece of property in North Minneapolis for the purposes of developing a training center for youth and adults. Now, I'm not the person that's actually going to run the programs, but the necessary resources are there that have been allocated from the Livable Communities Demonstration Assistance Grant for the purpose of activating the space. Now, we have our partnerships in place. We are asking for the city to sign the contract that's necessary to release those funds. Um, the city is a, a serve on various committees, uh, which includes the Energy Vision Advisory uh, Committee, and the city has committed itself to 100% renewables. There's no reason why we can't make sure that that work is actually done with equity. In addition to this, in addition to as I mentioned, the county, the uh, utilities, and the and the state. So I urge you and ask you all, as we think about these resources that we're all kind of here talking about, to use the money that's actually from another entity to help to help address some of these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have. Speaker number 87, Mar Marina Kataka, and Speaker number 88, T Tamara Russell, and those are the last two that I have signed in. If you do wish to sign in, please visit the clerk stand here. Welcome. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Marina Kitaka. I live at 2421 DuPont Avenue South. Um, yeah, I wasn't planning or prepared to speak today, but I uh, was sitting here and listening to uh, the testimonies throughout this morning, and uh, one thing I noticed uh, as a pattern was 
uh, that depending on kind of the asks that people had, I, I noticed different things that they brought up, different examples. Um, the people asking for more cops tend to talk about damage to cars, damage to business margins, um, the nuisance of other uh, community members due to their homelessness or mental health struggles. Um, whereas the people who are doing work in their communities to address the core issues in constructive ways, their stories are often about the bodily safety, the lives, the food security, housing of the most marginalized trans youth, black and brown youth, indigenous youth, and pe people of color, um, people with low income. And so I guess, um, you know, I don't want someone's car to be damaged, but ultimately, I feel like the question is what do we value more? Is it property or human lives? Um, the lives of the most marginalized. And for me, that answer is easy, and I don't believe that um, cops are set up to be able to fix those core problems and um, create uh, a lot of danger. And um, so I think there's been so many people here who have shared about the work that they're doing and that they, can be, uh, they should be funded. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker today is Tamara Russell. Welcome. Hi. Good morning. I want to commend Jacob Fry and uh, what he said about Trump, that he was not welcome here. I marched with MLK 50 years ago, and we all know that this is still a very racist and corrupt country. And the problem, you will never solve the problems downtown for the wealthy businessmen until you solve the problems in North Minneapolis. My son, I lost my son. I know what's going on down in North Minneapolis. I used to go down there twice a week. The problem is drug abuse. We need more programs. We need to stop mass incarceration. My son went to jail for one marijuana cigarette. He was not a drug addict. He did not take hard drugs. I think you should legalize marijuana, not hard drugs and alcohol. I've been to the liquor store on Broadway and Lowry. It's like they're giving it away free. There's so much problems with chemical abuse. We need more drug treatment. We don't need more police. I live in Washington County. They're starting a program where they're gonna have social workers and mental health workers that you could call 24 hours a day and they will come out. That We don't need more racist cops. The fourth precinct is the worst precinct in the city. It's nothing but racist cops. When they came, they did not call an ambulance for my son. They stole his wallet. They were laughing about it. They held it up in the air and said, we have your son's wallet and there's cash in it. I went to internal affairs, which did nothing. They said, we can't do anything because of Jamar Clark. They, they put me on hold for years. Civil uh, rights didn't do anything. They stole my son's wallet. And then when the coroner left, they said, oh, you can leave now. He was just an alcoholic. Thank you, Tamara. I appreciate it. With that, colleagues, we've concluded today's public hearing. I'll ask if there are any questions from my colleagues. I do not have speaker management up, so if you could just signal. I'm not seeing any. I'll note, we did have interpreters on hand today, and I appreciate their time, though they weren't needed. Um, we will continue to have them through the future public hearings. I'd like to re reiterate, oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Jenkins. Thank you, Chair Parmesano. I just wanna um, acknowledge and appreciate all of the input and, and work and organization that so many members of our community have um, engaged in to come and give us their input on the 2020 budget. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to echo that, and I, I know I speak for all of my colleagues here and probably many of you in the audience when I say today was so decent and respectful no matter how different our views were, and I really appreciate that, and I hope we can continue that for the rest of the budget cycle. I'd like to reiterate that the City Council budget process continues with two additional times to weigh in. Those are scheduled for December 4th and the 11th. 
Both of those hearings start at 6.05 p.m. in this chamber. Council Member Gordon. Didn't mean to necessarily interrupt you, but I just, just wanted to make a comment because Mr. Bicking near the end there raised some concerns about the transparency of the budget. I'm in a unique situation here because I sit next to the uh, budget director and was able to get a quick tutorial and through um, the work of uh, the budget department and the clerk's office, we do have a open portal transparency in government um, and there is more information so you can actually dive into a program even in, you can see within the police department in investigations, what's for office supply, what's for salary, what was for fringe benefits, and you can look at it. And I'm um, happy, and I suspect Micah might even be happy, to help give a tutorial to Mr. Bicking or others, uh, especially as this is the first hearing and we're having another hearing, if there's an opportunity to people out to, to actually see um, more details in the budget, I think we should publicize that and I'm sure we have to do a better job of helping us all understand how to see the numbers. So I just wanted to add that in response. Thanks for indulging me. Thank you. Going back to December 4th and December 11th, both of those hearings have been noticed and are listed on the published council calendar on the website. After the December 4th hearing, this is a little bit of procedure as to what happens next. The budget committee will take up the budget for markup on Friday, December 6th. It begins at 10 a.m., at which time council members have the ability to introduce any amendments. We will also use that meeting to follow up on any questions raised during the budget hearings we've conducted. That markup on December 6th will take place in this chamber. It is open to the public, though there is not a public hearing as part of it, and it will be broadcast. I want to thank everyone who took time to testify today and invite you to stay engaged through the budget process. I also want to thank our professional staff for their incredible work on bringing forward this budget to finance the city's operations and the delivery of our services. Seeing no further business before this committee, we are now adjourned.